guy from anywhere. All right, well, really, with no further ado, it's my privilege this morning to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, Mac Fulfer is with us. Many of you probably had an opportunity last night to uh, spend a little time with Mac, but he has uh, an incredible uh, ability that he's going to teach to us this morning, that of face reading. Uh, Mac's background is incredible. He has taught face reading to doctors, lawyers, um, psychiatrists, psychologists all across the country. He's made over 1,200 presentations. Um, in the next three hours, he is going to work with us and help us understand the basics of how to look at our customers and understand who they are and uh, give us the tools necessary to perhaps communicate with them a little bit better. So, Mr. Mac Fulfer. Good morning. I'm, I'm delighted to be here to have this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about this face reading, what it is and what it's not. First of all, it's not about the expressions on your face. So you can sit there completely stone-faced. It really doesn't make any difference. And it's not mind reading. So I guess that's a real comfort to some of you. You can go ahead and think whatever you want, and I won't know what you're thinking. But I would say it's like the next best thing. And this is what I mean. You know, if, uh, if you had your back turned and you heard a splash and you whipped around in time to see the ripple spreading out of the pond, well, if your back was turned, you won't know what was thrown in, just like I can't read your mind. But you still have a lot of information there. You can tell from where the center of the ripples are, that's where it was thrown in. You can tell by how far it spread out, well, approximately when it was thrown in. And you can tell from the size of the ripples whether what was thrown in was the size of a pebble or the size of a boulder. Your face is just like that pond. Every single time you have a thought or a feeling, every single time a neuron fires in your brain, there's a little microfascial movement that occurs in your face. Now, microfascial, that's so small you probably couldn't see it. And I'm not looking at the microfascial movements in your face. I'm not looking at what you're thinking right now. I'm looking at what you've been up to, how you've been working your face out. So, you know, your face is made out of the very same stuff that this is. So, you know, if, if this was a year you were going to get in shape and you went down to the health club and you worked out three hours a week, you'd expect to see some results. But your face, you've been working it out 24 hours a day from the day you're born to the day you die. I got interested in this as an attorney uh, because I wanted to do better jury selection. Because the judge doesn't really care. Just, you know, just get 12 people, let's get going. I got a golf game to get to. So, um, so I, I, that was my initial interest in it. I got to tell you, though, I was a total skeptic. I didn't believe that you could tell anything about somebody from their faces. But it intrigued me so much because it was such an accessible way of connecting with people. It's a way of, you know, instantly understanding them that things like handwriting analysis or Myers-Briggs test or those, those other things don't do. So what I did is I first started reading everything I could on it. Um, I didn't invent face reading. It goes back clear to Aristotle. Aristotle wrote two books on it over 2,000 years ago. I read everything I could on it, and then I started to try to sort out what was correct and what wasn't. I uh, started a company with a friend of mine, and for two and a half years, every single weekend, we went out and we set up a booth at every art show, Oktoberfest, Main Street, Rattlesnake Roundup, Peach Pit Festival. You can tell I'm from Texas from the festivals I went to. Uh, and I put up a sign that said, face reading guaranteed. Now, the guarantee was, if it's not absolutely correct, you won't have to pay. Well, I wasn't trying to get money from people. What I was trying to do was give them an incentive to give me truthful feedback. What happened after a fairly short period of time, though, people started going, you are spooky. No, 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 no. My mother came and told you about me, didn't she? That's, that's... But what most people said, what the vast majority said was, that's amazing. How did you do that? So I changed the sign to amazing face reading. And then my guarantee was, I'll read your face till you agree it's amazing. Um, I still read everything I possibly can on this topic. I've even got books on how to read horses' faces. Now, I got to tell you truthfully, I haven't mastered this one yet. But I'm saving this back for my retirement. When I uh, leave the lecture circuit, I'm going to learn this and, and go to the track and clean up. But um, <coughs> the... Uh, American Bar Association had me up in Chicago talking to them a while back, and the uh, director thought that I needed this book. Now, I don't know why, but she thought of all the people she knew that this would, I was the one that really needed it. This is a book on how to read buns, derrieres, fannies, whatever you want to call them. Now, I got to tell you truthfully, I, uh, 
Don't know how I'd ever do the validation research on that one, but uh, I am a little intrigued about being able to read people coming and going. You know, like whatever you see, you can read. My own book, um, this is my book, has been translated into Russian. It's uh, now being translated into Polish. Uh, I've got a contract translated into Arabic and Spanish. So the wonderful thing about this is it works on everybody, everybody in the whole world. What if you woke up one morning and you knew everybody on the planet? Not their name, but you knew enough about them that if you interacted with them at all, they would go, wow, have you been following me around? I mean, how do you know that? Um, I'll give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. I was in um, Outer Mongolia this past summer, and uh, I was reading a horse trainer's face in Outer Mongolia. And I gotta tell you, Mongolian people, some of the nicest people you'd ever wanna meet in the whole world. But still, I was a Westerner, and you know, he, he was sort of like checking this stuff out. So he was like scoping me out. And I don't speak Mongolian, so we were having to do this through an interpreter. So I was telling him what I saw in his face, and the interpreter was telling him, and then he started going, and then he said something. And I said, what did he say? The interpreter says, he says, you know him better than his family. And then he said something else. I said, what's he, what's he saying now? He says he wants to know about his future. <laughs> now, now, you never have to tell anybody you're reading their face. Every single one of you in this room can read faces just as good as I can. Today, my minimal expectation is by the time you leave here, you will never look at people the same way again. Uh, you can tell them, um, you can let them think you're psychic or an oracle, but one of the ways you can do it is just to say, you know, you look to me like, and then read their face, don't tell them you're, what you're doing, and they go, oh, well, you, whoa, you know me, man, you, you're brilliant. Um, so, I, when I first started out, I uh, went over to uh, TCU, that's where I graduated, graduated from back when dinosaurs ruled the earth, and asked them if I could uh, teach a class in their extended ed department on face reading. They said, well, well Mac, you know, this is, this is TCU, that's Texas Christian University, Now, this isn't some, you know, weird thing. I said, no, no, it's, it's scientific. They said, uh, okay, well, we'll let you have a class, we'll see how it works out. That first class, uh, before I ever had the class, I got a call from a fellow down at the Star-Telegram. Uh, that's the local newspaper back where I live in Fort Worth. And a uh, guy calls me up and says, uh, you know, I'm looking here in the TCU bulletin and it says, now, you're an attorney and, and you do what? And it, now, do you touch their face? or I mean, what, what, what is this face reading stuff? I said, well, you know, probably the easiest way for me to explain this to you is just to show you. So uh, I said, I could come over now if you want. He said, okay. So I went over to the Star-Telegram, rode the elevator up to the seventh floor. I get off and I'm greeted by this six foot two guy with a full beard and he's just beaming because he's like, I got this attorney. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't tell me, I didn't tell him that I had a beard, you know, so I, I got him. Stepped off the elevator, just started reading his face like I've read every face in here. I take one look at him and I said, uh, first thing I see about you, you're intense. Boy, when you make up your mind, you are definitely going for it. Those bushy eyebrows tell me lots of mental activity. Mine's going constantly all the time, but darn it, they're low. And the problem with low eyebrows is you take in information quickly, process it quickly, put it out quickly, but your brain's going so fast that when somebody's talking, you're having two or three thoughts, and you know if you don't say it, you're gonna forget it, so you have a terrible tendency to interrupt. Um, and not to, because you're being difficult, but just because you know, you know if you don't say it, you're gonna forget it. I said, the next thing I see about you, your nose, you're a natural provider. Somebody's under your umbrella, they're covered for life. Uh, your chin, even though you got a beard on it, tells me when you get down to acting on things, you put others first. And that beard tells me you're in a situation where you need more authority to keep some powerful people back off of you or direct and control your life the way you want it to go, but to you know, have some more authority. And uh, then I looked a little closer and I said, and your eyes, and these eyelids didn't match. I said, that eyelid hanging down the left tells me your intimacy requirements aren't being met in your personal life. <laughs> and then he got this shocked look on his face. He went, wow, that's amazing. And then he said, uh, would you go with me into the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> and then I guess it was my turn to have a shocked look on my face. And I, 
And he said, no, no, it's not that. He said, you, you just don't know how accurate you are. He said, let, let me tell you. First of all, uh, yeah, I get up an extra hour early every morning to make sure my kids have breakfast before they go off to school. And uh, I'm going through a divorce right now. And yes, I do need a little bit of extra authority. Her attorney is about to eat my lunch. And uh, yeah, my intimacy requirements haven't been met in my personal life lately. But he said, there's some mirrors in there and I just want you to show me how can you do this? I said, um, well, Paul, let's don't, let's don't go in the bathroom. I got an idea. Tell me who you think's the biggest critic or biggest skeptic up here and let's go talk to them. He thought about it a minute. Then we started winding our way through the Star Telegram. We're going past all these people, you know, working stories on their computers. He walks up to this guy, taps him on the back. He turns around and I promise you, my introduction was, this is Mac, he's gonna read your face. If he had told the guy I was gonna throw water on him, I wouldn't have got any different expression. He's given me this. So I just started reading his face. I said, first thing I see about you, straight eyebrows, you want facts. You want all the facts, data, and proof? Tangled eyebrows, you play devil's advocate. You're always looking for the yeah, but what if side of it. I said, your thin nose tells me you're self-reliant and self-sufficient. Uh, thin mouth, you keep it inside. You keep um, most of what's going on for you inside. And um, finally I said, and these lines right here, those are courage lines. And it uh, tells me you face some stuff that scared the daylights out of you, but you did it anyway. Your character's been forged by overcoming adversity. And his mouth fell open. Oh my God. He said, I was in Vietnam. And, and that's all he got to say because Paul interrupted us. You know, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't help it. Couldn't help it, he had low eyebrows. Paul interrupted and said, wait, 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 wait. I got you, Mac, I got you. I was in Vietnam and you didn't tell me that stuff. And his friend says, uh, yeah, that's right, Paul. We were both in Vietnam, but don't you remember, uh, you were in the Navy, you were on a ship. He said, I, I was in the Marines. I was crawling around through the jungle. I, might be a little bit of difference about how much courage we had to actually have in Vietnam. Um, didn't get to finish the interview that day. So I was back up the next day and I mean, in one of these glass cubicles and Paul was asking these questions and uh, I see his skeptical friend go by. And a few minutes, he goes by again, you know, he's looking in. And, I guess on about the third or fourth pass, uh, the door opens and he sticks his head and he says, yeah, I know y'all are busy, I, I don't want to bother you. He said, but uh, I got this picture of my wife here and boy, if you could help me out, I would really appreciate it. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, to tell you a little bit about how this works. First of all, every single one of you in here is a face reader. In fact, I saw a program the other day that I thought was fascinating. It was. Um, about some quantum physicists who were talking about the nature of reality. The thing in the program that stuck with me was, they said your brain is firing 400 billion times a second. 400 billion, now put that in perspective. A billionth is one second in 30 years, or about that far on a trip from New York to San Francisco. 400 billion times a second but we're only aware of about 2,000 of those. Put that into perspective. If this sign here, if this represented your brain firing 400 billion times a second, you couldn't put a dot on here small enough to represent the part that you know that you know. But just because you don't know you know it, doesn't mean you don't know it. Most of what we know, we don't know we know. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but you know, stop and think about it. Uh, you don't know how to control your heartbeat or your blood pressure or your body temperature or your cell division. But obviously you do know how to do it because you're doing it. So on some level you know it, it's just that you're not consciously aware of it. Um, and you could be. I mean, there's uh, Tibetan monks who can raise their body temperature and sit out in the snow and dry wet sheets on their back or even stop their heart. So, you know, it's something you possibly could know. But one of the things that we know that we don't know we know we don't know how connected we are. We're all intensely connected. You know, it, it looks like, no, you're, I'm not you, you're not me. We're all separate, we're all individuals, we're all unique. Well, that's kind of how it looks, but that's not really what's going on. We're social animals. You know, we're like ants or bees. I mean, we've survived by being able to connect and relate. And we're connecting and relating on levels that we're not even aware of. Um, if I said to you, you know, you can't see it, you can't feel it, but this room is just full of all this stuff. It's like this 
wiggly energy stuff. It's got all these codes and, and information in it, and it's just everywhere. It's like even under the table, and it's like, that guy's nuts. But then you walk over to your TV set, and you turn it on, and you don't have any problem believing that this machine is somehow sucking these invisible things out of the air and turning it into a TV program, or your radio, or your microwave. Heck, the judge believes the policeman's radar gun over you, and you were there, you know, so, but you can't see it. Well, one of the things you can't see, you can't see what we're picking up on, and we're all picking up on each other all the time, because our mind is a million times more complex than a TV set. Uh, examples of what I'm talking about, you can take um, a mother who wakes up in the middle of the night and instantly knows there's something wrong with her infant before the baby let out a peep. Or twins, twins that can be separated by half a continent and one twin suddenly knows there's something wrong with the other twin. Or you, how many times have you thought of somebody and then the phone rings and you go, oh my gosh, I was just thinking about you. Or you start to say something and before you can say it, the person next to you says exactly what you were about to say. We're all intensely connected. One of the ways that we're connected is we're all face readers. Every single one of you in this room is already a face reader. But you're doing it a little different. You know, your brain's firing 400 billion times a second, you're aware of 2,000. The 400 billion times a second, you're building up a data bank of prior experience and your brain is constantly sorting through looking for a pattern recognition. So when you walked in here, you didn't have to stop and think, let's see, those are screens and these are tables and those are chairs because as soon as you get a hit, as soon as you have a pattern recognition, you know what it is. So it's the difference between the part of your brain that's thinking and the part of your brain that's knowing. Um, one of the things about what that we do with pattern recognition though is people. So every person you've ever met in your life is stored in your head somewhere in that subconscious part of your brain. So when we meet somebody, we have this sort of like, Oh, I like him, or I don't trust that guy. But that's about as far as you get with it. And here's your problem with your face reading abilities right now. The more people you know, the more you interact with them, especially if you're in sales, you get to where you have a pretty good feel of people. Like, he's going to be like that, and he, she's like this. You got a pretty good feel of people, but it's sort of one-word descriptions, and you couldn't really explain what it is that you saw. Um, the main problem you have is that it's subjective. So for example, if uh, your uncle was a big guy with a beard and you thought he hung the moon, when you grow up and you see a big guy with a beard, you go, that's a nice man, I know I'm gonna like him. But if a big guy with a beard lived next door to you and chased you out of his yard when you were a kid and, or scared you when you grew up and you see a big guy with a beard, you go, that's a mean guy, can't trust him. So you know, you've projected your personal life experience onto your face reading abilities. We're gonna straighten some of that out today to where you will actually start to see people differently. Why this is important? This is important because it allows you to see people without stereotyping them, without putting them into some kind of category. So let's, uh, let me show you what I'm talking about for just a second. Um, up. Now, how do I pull this up? Are y'all controlling this? Okay. Oh, oh, can you make it full screen yet? Oh, okay. We got faith to help. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I'm going to turn the pages. Um, thank you, Faith. I wanted to tell y'all something else, too. Uh, this is not formal. So, I mean, if you need to get up and go out for a minute, nah, go ahead. Uh, don't, don't sit around and wait or be uncomfortable if you, if you need to go use the restroom or run outside for something. Um, so, okay, let's look at this for a minute. Tell me what do you see in this picture? Mona Lisa. Yeah, that went hard. Now, how did you know it was Mona Lisa, though? Your brain searched through your unconscious data bank. You're holding a picture in there of Mona Lisa somewhere, and it comes up and it feels like Mona Lisa. But how far back can you go and still see it's Mona Lisa? Probably the last picture in the bottom row. Maybe the last picture on the top row if you were like an artist or something. But let me give you a tougher one than that. What do y'all see in that picture? 
Abraham Lincoln, now come on, how can you see Abraham Lincoln? You might see it a little better on, uh, on that one if that's too big for you. There's no nose, there's no eyes, there's no mouth, there's no ears. It's just a bunch of colored squares. But it comes close enough to your pattern recognition that you get a hit on it. It feels like Abraham Lincoln. Now, I want to see a, a show of hands. How many people in here did not see Abraham Lincoln? Don't be embarrassed. If you didn't see Abraham Lincoln, there's nothing wrong with your brain. It's just that you're operating out of the part that's firing 2,000 bits per second where you are thinking rather than knowing. Um, but you're still, you're still a face reader, and I'm gonna prove that to you. Let's look at these two guys for just a minute. Based on your life experience, your internal data bank, look at these two guys and tell me, which one do you think is an ex-bouncer from a nightclub and which one do you think used to be an accountant for Arthur Anderson? <laughs> now, see, you got a hit on it, but then you kind of like, oh, I don't know, and you blow it up. And let me see another show of hands. How many of you thought the guy with three feet of forehand, forehead was the, the uh, accountant? Yeah. Yeah, that, you know, that, that's great. I, I, let, let's see, you can see y'all are already doing it. Now, let me give you a tougher one than this. Say you're going to your kid's open house. You haven't made any school teachers yet. Look at these two guys. And tell me, uh, which one do you think is the football coach? And which one do you think is the science and math teacher? <laughs> Once again, I want to ask you, which one do you think, uh, the, looking at the one that does have three feet of forehead, um, do you think that he's the science and math teacher? Yeah, yeah, okay. That actually makes me feel better. I, I used to worry about losing my hair, but now I realize I'm just looking smarter. You know, I, <laughs> the more forehead, the smarter you look. So I told you, let's look at this for just a second. I told you that you were already reading faces. Which one of those is a football coach? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty easy. Parcells, you know Parcells. Which one's football player? Three, yeah, that's easy. Uh, which one do you think is a farmer? Seven. Seven, yeah, that's easy. How about a migrant farmer? Ten, Ten yeah, that's, that's pretty. How about a college professor? Eleven. Twelve, six. Hey, see, now it starts to get tougher, doesn't it? But here's the problem. The way you're reading faces right now, you're stereotyping people. You're, you're put, trying to put them in a box. And you can't do that with people. People are too unique and too, too absolutely inexplicable to be able to ever care, stereotype them. There is no stereotype that you can come up with which will fit all the people of the stereotype. You know, all Baptists aren't alike, all Republicans aren't alike, all, all attorneys aren't alike. There's no, there's no way you can stereotype them. <clears throat> People are actually more like snowflakes. You know, no two alike. So if somebody asked you to describe a snowflake, you couldn't stereotype it. What you would have to do is describe all the little pieces and parts. That's what face reading does. Face reading allows you to look at somebody from a different perspective. Instead of stereotyping them, you're describing them like a snowflake. So uh, say number six there. What if number six decided that he wanted to give up his job at the college and go be a farmer? then you're, you'd have missed him. However, if you're reading his face, what you can see is he's very bright, he's good with logic, theory, planning, academics, and loves distinctions. That if I'm gonna sell him something, I know that I have to show him that what I've got is better than what he's got, even if it's corn, you know, that I have to sh show him those distinctions. Now, I told you, when I first started out, I was a skeptic. That actually shows up in my face. And I can look around the room and I can see the fellow skeptics in the room. There's one right there, you're in my club. Uh, we belong in the same club. And here's what I'm looking at. Uh, when we're suspicious about what people tell us, these little muscles in the corners of our mouth tighten up and pull down. So if you put a dot in the corners of my mouth, the one in the center and connect the dots, you'll see that my mouth, like your mouth, and like, oh, uh, like your mouth, turn down. Now, I don't know how you got yours, but for me, 23 years of practicing law, and people coming in telling me their stories, and I'm sitting there going, mm -hmm, yeah, I believe that. And you do that enough times, you start to get one of these downturned mouths. Um, 
Here's where this is important, because this is what I'm trying to tell you. I know that you've already heard hundreds of presentations on sales, like uh, the best sales approach, the best. But the problem with that is there's 6.4 billion people on this planet, and they're all as individual as snowflakes. So there's not one size fits all. There's not one sales approach that's gonna fit everybody. What face reading does, it allows you to see that person directly. You know, when you got down here, if somebody came up to you and said, oh, hey, John, how are you doing? How, how's things going? What did you know you were supposed to say? Fine, oh, we're good. Yeah, fine, everything's fine. How are you doing? Nothing happened. We walk around with this little social shell on, you know, where we keep up our little social shell and defense because we think nobody wants to know what, what, how I really feel, what's really going on. So we have this wall up. Most communications you have, most of the communications you have with another person is really kind of like bumper cars running into each other. You know, we smile, we nod our heads. Oh yeah, that's great. And then the wheels fall off and you go, well, what happened? Well, if you could read faces, you could see what happened. And the point is how to get past the wall. How do you get past this social wall and truly connect with somebody? The art of sales is really not about how smart you are, how good looking you are, how well dressed you are. It's your ability to connect with that other person, to get past their defenses, because we're all going through life defended. This face reading stuff is inherent. And what I mean by that, little bitty babies are face readers. Little bitty babies can already read their mother's face. But a little bitty baby is not just doing it for purposes of identification. Little bitty babies are also responding to the shape of faces. Babies respond to anything on a face with a round shape. So uh, if another little toddler comes up to the crib, it's got chubby round cheeks, a little round chin, high round eyebrows, baby sees a toddler, starts gooing, laughing, interacting with the toddler. As human beings, we are alarmed, are repelled by anything on a face with a 45 degree angle. So if an adult male walks up to the crib that's got really angled eyebrows and a pointed goatee beard, sticks his face over the baby's crib, the baby starts crying. What'd you do, pinch that baby? Nope, it was just your face. Your face scared the baby. <laughs> no, I mean, stop and think about that. You know, why, why in horror movies do they have weird wolves? I mean, wolves haven't killed anybody. Why don't they have weird bears or weird tigers or weird hippopotamuses makes more sense than weird wolves? Well, unfortunately, the poor wolf, everything on its face is a 45 degree angle. Its ears are 45 degree angle, its eyes are 45 degree angle, its snout. So we, alarm, we respond with alarm to any face that has a 45 degree angle on it. I've just told you ladies in here something really important. If you're in a difficult situation, people are kicking sand in your face, nobody's listening to what you have to say, you go home tonight, draw you on some angled eyebrows, tomorrow they won't jack with you. <laughs> and okay, whatever you say, yeah. Because we really do respond to faces. We're all face readers all the time. But uh, take this a step further, go to the elementary school and watch what's going on. And here's what you notice. All the little kids who have broad faces, faces that look like tigers, are chasing all the little narrow-faced kids that have faces that look like gazelles. There's sort of this predator-prey thing going on, even from childhood. And the reason that face reading works is because we're all face readers. You know, when they get ready to choose sides, watch what happens. The kid with the action hero face, and you know what I mean by action hero, they have these powerful cheeks, got these big powerful jaws, got a big chin, low straight eyebrows, high straight nose, you know, Batman, Superman, they all look alike. When they get ready to choose sides, they go, oh, let Tommy be the captain. And Tommy with the action hero face, his whole life, he got chosen to be the captain. So he grows up thinking, I'm the captain. I'm the leader, I'm in charge. Heck, I'm gonna run for governor of California. I'm in charge, you know? <laughs> because I mean, that's the way people responded to your face. Now, if you weren't so lucky and you had a face like mine when you were a little kid, and I had sticky out of ears and high round eyebrows, a little small chin, a little thin face. This was my experience on the playground. Oh, choose me, choose me, choose me. After everybody else was chosen, it was always the same. The two captains would have this conversation. We don't want him. Well, we're not taking him. So I grew up thinking, well, I guess I'm not an athlete. Maybe, 
Maybe I'm a lawyer or something like that. So, you know, the way people respond to your face will give you some sense of self-definition. Now, I wanna tell you how to use this for your own personal benefit, though. I was teaching this to some realtors just the other day about how to use this for sales. And um, I uh, don't know why, or there he is, he's back. We got play, guys playing with me back there. Um, I explained to him. So if you're talking to a guy who has a downturn mouth, the first thing you know is that he's suspicious about what people tell him. So, you know, that's the, that is the first thing to understand. That's his defense, that's his wall. And what you need to understand, you can't start out with pie in the sky. You know, if you say something like, oh, this is the best piece of property I got listed, you can't possibly go wrong with this. This will make a wonderful investment for you. You know what all of us with a downturn mouth here? Uh-huh, sure. I bet he says that about every piece of property he's got. Next piece of property down, he's gonna say the very same thing. That's just his line. A better approach to take with somebody who has a downturn mouth, while it's counterintuitive, is don't tell us something good about it, tell us something wrong with it. With the realtors, I was explaining to them, a much better approach would be, you know, before I even show you this piece of property, I just wanna let you know, that, that guy next door, I don't know what his problem is. He thinks the property line is six inches over this way. Now, you know, you've got a title policy and a warranty deed, and we even did a survey, but I just wanna let you know about that guy next door before I show you the property. And you know what the guy with the downturned mouth hears this time? Wow, now he didn't have to tell me that. Hey, this guy will tell me the bad news. I can trust this guy. I can believe what he's telling me. So you just got past his wall. You got past his defense because it's like, oh yeah. And so us with a downturned mouth, a better sales approach is first tell us something wrong about it and then, then how you're gonna fix it, you know, or how you still are better than whatever else is out there on the market. Uh, it helps dissolve that wall. Now what's wonderful is I don't care how the person's mouth starts out. If you're talking to somebody and as you're talking to them, you suddenly see their mouth turned down, something just happened. Neurons just fired in their brain and at that very instant, they have become more wary, suspicious, guarded or judgmental about what you're saying. What a powerful piece of information that is. To be able to say exactly like the rock being thrown in the pond at the exact moment, you look like you're having a problem with that. Well, I was, but how did you know? Now that's where you say, oh, I'm an oracle or I'm psychic or, or I read your face, you know? I gotta tell you, if you tell somebody you're reading their face though, if you tell, if you tell somebody you're gonna like uh, do their uh, horoscope or do their numbers, I mean, most people go, meh. When you, when you tell somebody you can read their face, they're like, no, you can't. What does my face say? Everybody wants to know what their face says. Um, so let's look at this for just a second. I've already read every face in this room. There's no, most of, most of y'all in here have nice straight mouths. Most of y'all, your habit of mind has been to be a good, clear, reflective listener. You don't th make things better than the person said or worse than the person said. You've been a good, neutral sounding board capable of giving good, direct, honest feedback. I haven't seen any, any mouths like that. I haven't seen anybody in this room, and I've been looking, that, whose mouth turns up all the time. I mean, all the time, even when nothing funny's going on. That doesn't surprise me because if you run into somebody whose mouth turns up all the time, I mean all the time, you're probably talking to either a dolphin or an idiot. I know that sounded kind of cruel, but um, that would be somebody who enthusiastically believes everything that they're told. Now, maybe dolphins get away with it because you know they don't lie to each other, but most of us have had mothers and grandmothers that told us things like, Wipe that idiotic grin off your face. What are you, some kind of grin and imbecile? We know that people who go around with this little blissed out grin on their face all the time usually don't have their feet fully planted on the floor. However, it is an important thing to know because if um, I was trying to sell somebody uh, a book with that type of face, I would say, you know, the last person that bought one of these for me won the lottery. Oh, give me two, you know. So, uh, you know, it's uh, gullible. Now, I promised you that by the time that we left here, you would never look at people the same way again. Uh, play this game with me for a second. Make the white show up underneath the colored part of your eye. Yeah, 
He's doing it. He just pulled these lids down. I didn't put any restrictions on you. You know, he could have looked up. But let me show you the easy way to do that. The easiest way to make the white show up underneath the colored part of your eye is just have a stressful thought. Physiologically, what happens anytime we have a stressful thought? Our eyes float up. Can you imagine what a powerful piece of information that is? The next time you're talking to somebody, if as you're talking to them, you happen to see that you can see the white showing up underneath the, their iris, for Pete's sake, stop. You just stressed them out. They're not getting what you're saying anymore. They're having a stress attack. But you can actually know more than that. If you look closer with face reading, you can see why they're stressing out. You know, most of us are familiar with the concept of left brain, right brain. Your left brain is sort of like uh, your computer. It divides the world into little monads of data that we organize into logical sequences to come up with, predict with predictable results. It's how you all got down here this morning. Our right brain is our imaginative, intuitive, creative, artistic. You could even say childhood side because as kids, we didn't have a lot of verbal or math skills yet. We were sort of operating out of that 400 billion pattern recognition side of our brain. But we're crosswired. And what I mean is everything in your left brain is hooked up to the right side of your face and body and everything in your right brain is hooked up to the left. I had a uh, step-grandfather when I was seven he had a stroke on the, on the right side of his brain, but it paralyzed the left side of his body. That we're all wired like that. It doesn't matter whether you're left or right handed. It doesn't matter whether you're dyslexic or had ADD. If you're a human being with a brain in your head, that's the way you're wired. That's sort of a long explanation. All I ask you to do with that, forget that. Just remember this. When I look at somebody, I divide their face right down the middle. And I know what shows up on the left side of their face. Now, as I'm pointing to this, this is on your right, but this is the left side of my face, is about their personal life. It's about their relationships. It's about their childhood. What shows up on the right side of the person's face is about their professional business or external world side. So uh, let's apply that for just a second. I uh, was teaching a class over at TCU. Young girl comes in, she sits down. I take one look at her, I can see an eighth of an inch of white showing up underneath their eyes. Now I wanna tell you, I don't care if you completely forget what all this stuff means, you're already getting, you're already getting corrupted here because the next time you run into somebody, you're, when you're seeing the white showing up underneath their eyes, you're gonna go, ooh, that means something, you know? <laughs> and, well, I mean, that was true for me too. So I'm looking at her and I see this white, but what really bothered me, she had more white under her right eye. So it told me she was stressing out about something in her professional, business, or external world side. So I'm, I'm trying to think about that and think, well, I guess, I guess my class is sort of her external world. Maybe she's having some kind of problem with the class. Finally, I just can't take it any longer. I go over to her and say, are you okay? You look like you're having some stress. Is it, is it something about the class? Is it? She said, oh, no, no, no. I said, I'm, I'm really enjoying your class. She said, you got me. I am stressing out. She said, uh, this morning, my boss came to me and told me Friday's going to be my last day. She said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. So while she's sitting there taking the face reading class, all she can really think about is having been fired that morning. Wasn't too long after that, a fellow came in. Uh, he was showing the opposite. He had more white under his left eye. So I asked him the same series of questions. He said, that's amazing. He said, you nailed me. He said, uh, yep, I am having some stress today. He said, uh, I had a dental appointment this afternoon and I thought I was just going in to get my teeth cleaned. It turned into a root canal and he said, now the Novocaine's wearing off and it's about to kill me, but different kind of stress. That's personal or physical side stress. Um, this is why this is important. I've taught this all over the entire world. I've taught it in New Zealand. I've taught it in Africa. I've taught it in South America, Central America, Europe, all over the United States, Hawaii, Canada. It applies to every single human being on the face of the planet. But I was talking to uh, a group down in uh, Alabama a few years ago. They were the Southeast Car Wash Association. Now, something I got to tell you about the Southeast Car Wash Association. Those are not touchy-feely guys. Most of those guys never went to college. Most of them out of high school opened up a Jiffy Lube or car wash, and now a lot of them are multimillionaires. But the problem they have is they have real high turnover. So what they were looking for with the face reading was how to hire the right person for the right job. How to understand who's the kid 
who's perfectionist enough and particular enough and a self-starter that you can put him out there on the grease rack and he'll be sure to put that oil plug back in correctly without cross-threading it so you don't have to buy somebody an engine because all their oil leaked out after their oil change. And who's the kid who's better with people that you want to put him behind the cash register to increase sales? Well, this is what I was explaining to him. Say you, uh, say you are interviewing a young kid and you've asked him some questions and you come to uh, a tough question. Now, uh, Johnny, have you ever been uh, terminated for uh, theft? And bingo, you see the white showing up underneath his eyes. You can't go, ah, gotcha, guilty. Because it's not about what you're saying, it's about what he's thinking. And you know, we all have innocent random thoughts. I mean, just things that pop in our head. I mean, he could have been thinking something like, uh, wow, I don't remember putting money in my parking meter. Or I don't think I locked my car. And if he happened to have that thought at exactly that moment of time, then he could have a stress response. So this is how you use this. I was teaching this to the FBI on uh, interrogating and spotting terrorists recently, but um, here's how you use this. When you're talking to somebody and as you're talking to them, you suddenly notice that you saw the white show up underneath their eyes. Okay, they just stressed out. You don't know why yet. So the first thing you wanna do is make a mental note of what it was you were talking about. The second thing you do is look closer and see where is there more white? More white under the right eye, they're stressing out about what you're talking about, the data, the information. More white under the left eye, stressing out personally, maybe about you, maybe you're intimidating them. You're, you're causing them the stress. The third thing you wanna do, drop it. Talk about something else. Let their eyes come back to normal. Circle around in your conversation and bring it up again. Now, if you bring it up again and nothing happens, then the first time might have been a false positive. Maybe he was thinking about his unlocked car or the parking meter. But if you bring it up again, and the instant you bring this topic up again, you instantly get a stress response again. Aha, now you're starting to get a correlation. I would probably do it three times. But if three times out of three times, when I, get, when I hit on this topic, I get a stress response, I would say there's a very high probability that what they're stressing out about is connected with what I'm talking about. And if I look closer, I can see why. It's still not mind reading. But what it's done, it's narrowed the scope of your inquiry. You know, because you spend, you know, 35, 40 minutes with somebody and you think everything went really well and then the wheels fall off and you go, what happened? What, what, what's wrong? And to be able to know exactly when something happens, when there was a change, is as important as knowing what. It allows you to narrow your, your focus and concentrate on what the problem is. I've got to tell you, <clears throat> In most conversations, including this one, do you know who's who really listening? The person talking. And you know what they're listening to? Themselves. And you know what the other person's doing? Ah, oh, they're sort of listening, but they're also going like, does loss come on tonight or was that last night? And I need to stop by the bank and pick up some money on the way home. God, I hope this guy's not gonna be too boring. I mean, you got, you got this other little, this other little uh, script running in your head all the time. Uh, so, one of the things that this does, it allows you to see past the other person's wall and into where they're really coming from. You know, what's really going on for them. Um, let, me, uh, let me show you something else. If you ever happen to see this, if you ever look across the desk and you notice that you see the white showing up over the tops of their eyes, this is your correct response. Oh my gosh, look at the time. I am so sorry. <laughs> I've got an appointment, I gotta, I'm late, I gotta go right now because this person just went postal on you. <laughs> now, I gotta tell you, I talked to the US Post Office. I, I didn't use that turn of phrase with them, but you know, you got a good idea what I mean. If you don't know what I meant, um, when I was down in New Zealand, I don't know how much you know about uh, New Zealand, but it was inhabited originally by the Maori. They're like our American Indians. Very fierce, very warlike bunch of people, um, very territorial. To this day, if you come on a Maori island without an escort, they've got a sentry at the top of the island, and the second that your foot hits the sand, this is the guy who's gonna be in your face. So uh, if you're wondering what potential violence looks like, that's what it looks like. Um, if you ever happen to see this, if you ever happen to see the whites all the way around the person's eyes, 
Person's gone into a state of mental disconnect. Nobody home. Nobody's answering the phone upstairs. Could be high on drugs. Remember the runaway bride? That's a perfect example of that. You know, <laughs> nobody home. Nobody's answering the phone. Could be uh, going into shock. Could be leaving their body. Uh, this actually saved a life. When I'm back home, I, I always have a sheet of paper up front and I tell people, if you're interested in taking a class, put your name and telephone number down and when I'm doing a class in your area code, I'll, I'll give you a call. So I'm putting the class together and I called this lady up and she said, oh, Thursday, no, I can't do it Thursday. She said, but keep my name on the list because you know, your talk the other day saved a life. I said, really, I'd like to hear about that. She said, well, I'm a home healthcare nurse. And she said, after your presentation, she said, I went to do my rounds. And she said, I walked in to see one of my clients and she was sitting there in her wheelchair. And she said, the first thing that I saw about her was I could see the white all the way around her eyes. And I said, Miss Johnson, are you okay? Are you feeling all right? And she said, Miss Johnson said, oh, honey, I'll be fine. I, you got so many people you're trying to take care of. No, I'll be all right. I don't want to be a bother. And she said, if she hadn't just come from the presentation, she would have taken Miss Johnson for a word. But having just heard this information, she thought, well, you know, it might be better to err on the side of caution than to make a mistake here. So she called somebody up to come check Miss Johnson out. She went on about her rounds. She finished and checked back in and discovered Miss Johnson had been admitted to the hospital. And when she checked with the people at the hospital, they said, boy, we don't know how you did it, but if you hadn't got her in here when you did, she wouldn't be here today. Because you see, Miss Johnson was disconnecting. She was sort of already leaving her body. And that's not the only time face reading saved a life. Uh, the, for the past three years, I've talked to the Association of General Contractors. Oh my gosh, it's an a, a enormous group. Uh, they have like oh, 10, 15,000 guys show up. Uh, also not touchy-feely guys, you know, but they got a lot of money. And uh, I've even had times when, when my presentation was on at the same time that Colin Powell's was on, you know, so I'm kind of in competition in that way. Um, but I was, last time I talked to him was down in Orlando enormous convention center down there. And you know, this is face reading, it's not national security. So they, they put me in a room that really you needed a GPS satellite locator and a bicycle to find this room. But I'm thinking, yeah, I doubt if anybody's gonna find this. But before I can get the first books out, a guy pops his head and says, oh, Mac, he says, I'm glad I found you. He said, I gotta get one of your books. He said, you ran out in Vegas last year. He said, but you know, that talk you gave saved a life. I said, really, I'd like to hear about that. He said, well, I was at this conference the other day and the guy beside me just keeled over, passed out and hit the floor. He said, I took one look at him and I noticed that he had those lines in his ears that you were talking about. So he said, I started yelling, hey, quick, quick, this man's having a heart attack. And they got somebody over there and he said, I didn't think too much more about it until he wrote me this long letter thanking me for saving his life. But he said, you know, I, if, if I hadn't come to your presentation, I wouldn't even got involved. Like, I don't know anything about that. So even if it saves a couple of lives, it's probably well worth knowing. Um, let's look at that for just a second. Now, some people say, oh, come on, Mac, you can't tell anything about somebody from their face. You're born with your face. Well, you're born with a face, but your face is constantly changing. Go back and look at your baby picture. Uh, look at the example, look for example at Timothy McVeigh. Uh, your mind is actually what's holding your face in place. Have you ever gone to a funeral where they had an open casket? It's like, boy, that didn't look like Uncle Bob. It's because we are mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual beings. And three-fourths of them's not there. The part that actually is holding your face in place is not, no longer there. And your face is being held in place by your habitual patterns of thought and feeling. So you look at uh, Timothy McVeigh, there is he's probably his high school picture. He's got high round eyebrows. He's got a broad nose, got full lips, got a round chin. Now look at the transformation from then until the time of the bombing of the Murrah building. His eyebrows have gone from high to low, from round to straight, his nose from wide to thin. His lips look like a razor blade cut where his mouth used to be and his chin, you think you can't change a chin, has gone from round to totally straight or square. I'm a better example than that. My whole life, my ears stuck straight out like this. You know, I've, I, I call those Ross Perot ears, you know. Uh, somebody who's independent, nonconformist, does everything their own way. Like, hey, Ross, what are you, a Republican or a Democrat? I'm an independent, you know, that's... Uh. Well, that was true for me. Now, I didn't have too much problem with it until I started practicing law. 
I opened up my own law practice because I didn't, you know, I was too independent to practice with anybody else. So I opened up a sole practitioner law office. And my problem was, if the other side didn't immediately agree, well, I just, by golly, we're going to court. Now, I didn't mind that part. I didn't mind going to court. But what I soon discovered was, if I was over in court trying a case, if anybody came in looking for an attorney and there was nobody there, they just went on. So I was cutting my own throat. So I had to learn how to negotiate. I learned how, needed to learn how to find middle ground. I promise you, I didn't go home and staple my ears to my head or tape them back at night. Uh, I didn't even know about face reading then, but when I changed, my ears changed. They went from sticking straight out to in at the top and out at the bottom. These are diplomat ears. Somebody that can think on their feet, can find middle ground and learns how to negotiate. Um, we were talking about eyes. Uh, the lady on the far left is the pom-pom mom. She was the one who was trying to put out a contract on her daughter's rival's mother, hoping that would help her daughter become cheerleader. And you ask yourself, is that lady capable of that? Oh, yes, that's one spooky lady. In fact, I was uh, down in Houston and ran into a guy who used to be her next door neighbor at a conference I was speaking at. He said, oh yeah, that lady's a whack job. The next three guys are all deceased. Uh, Rick on the far right, you can see the whites all the way around their eyes. Rick on the far right committed suicide by a police officer. Now, I don't know about y'all. Uh, I know you come from all different parts of the country, but um, Rick jumped into the back of a police officer's pickup truck and started smashing out the back window. And in Texas, they'll shoot you for that. So, I mean, <laughs> officer shot him through the window and, and uh, killed him. But, um, you can see from the time that Rick's picture was taken, mentally, his belt wasn't going through all the loops. You know, he wasn't, wasn't quite there. The next person is the first person that got killed in Bosnia. But he didn't get killed in action. He picked up a landmine, started working on it with a screwdriver, and blew himself to kingdom come. So I guess until then, his elevator didn't go to the top floor. And finally, you remember that cult out in California a few years ago that all committed mass suicide together? Mr. Applewhite was the head of that cult, but you can see from his picture that mentally, he was already on the spaceship that they thought was following the comet. You know, they were gonna kill themselves and float up to the spaceship, you know, and all take off with the space alien. You can see he's on the spaceship. Um, while we're on eyes, if you ever happen to see this. Now, I gotta tell you, uh, most of the things in the book are very positive. It's written in a way that what I'm trying to do is connect with people. And, and life is a paradox. You know, you can talk about the good side or the bad side. You could say about somebody, you have a high capacity for intimacy, or you could say you're clingy. You know, you're just which way you wanna, wanna phrase it. But this one's a little different. If you ever run into somebody whose upper eyelids are cutting their pupils in half, it's someone who's not on the same page mentally with the rest of us. It's someone who's so focused on their internal agenda that the external world seems like an illusion to them. Um, I guess a perfect example of that. You remember those snipers that were terrorizing the East Coast for a while? What was her name? Uh, John Muhammad and Malvo, remember those? Now, the first time they put their picture in the paper, they looked like a charming father-son team, unless you were a face reader. And if you were a face reader, what you saw is both of them had these upper eyelids cut the pupils in half. Um, I guess an even, even better example than that, I was uh, up at Denton, just north of where I live, talking to uh, a bunch of uh, school teachers at uh, Touchstone Academy. Now, I didn't know anything about the academy. I thought it was a college prep school. It was actually one of these alternative schools. After you've been kicked out of every other school, your last chance for, to be in school is Touchstone Academy. It's run by psychologists and psychotherapists, primarily. Anyway, uh, they hadn't heard of this stuff before. When we got to this part, they said, whoa, wait, 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 wait. We want to check this out. So they went and pulled out their mug shots. That's what I call them. But uh, they went through them, and the only two kids who were in there for murder were also the only two kids whose upper eyelids cut the pupils in half. And you know, you sort of already know that. I mean, what makes the Frankenstein monster scary? Well, I'm, I mean, he is 10 feet tall, and he's got a bar in his neck. But you know, I mean, he's, <laughs> he's got stiff legs. I mean, anybody could outrun Frankenstein. What makes him scary is those eyes. You know, that if you ever close your eyes, he's going to break through the wall and grab you. That's what you're... Or the uh, Sopranos. Do you ever look on the Sopranos? The hitman's the one who's got those upper eyelids cutting the pupils in half. So you can see that immediately. Now, here's what I've got to explain to you, though. If you ever run into somebody who you see the upper eyelids cutting the pupils in half, you can't go, murder! <laughs> because 
You have never in your life seen a single statue or picture of Buddha that you didn't notice that the upper eyelids cut the pupils in half. And if you know anything about Buddha, Buddha was the most pacifistic person that ever walked the face of the earth. I mean, Buddha wouldn't harm a fly. But what is the Buddhist philosophy? The external world is an illusion. It's Maya, it doesn't really exist. The only thing that's real is the internal or spiritual world. So that's what they're trying to portray. Buddha's focus on his internal or spiritual world. Um, let's look at that for just a second. I wanna show you how fast you're picking this stuff up. Now look at these terrorists for just a minute and here's what you know that you didn't know a few minutes ago. You can look at them and you can see now that being a terrorist is a really stressful job. <laughs> I mean, every one of these guys is showing some kind of major stress. Um, what you now know that you didn't know before though is you can see which ones knew they were on a suicide mission and which ones just thought they were hijacking a plane. Those with those upper eyelids cutting those pupils in half, their mental focus is Allahu Akbar, I don't care what happens to me, I'm gonna be in heaven with the virgins in a few minutes anyway. Um, which one of those would you least wanna meet in a dark alley? I tell you who usually gets picked, Ada in the upper right-hand corner and De Hoyos in the bottom right-hand corner. If you pick De Hoyos, he's the only one on there who's not a Arab terrorist. But if you picked him, oh, you're right. De Hoyos used to live in Fort Worth. He got put in jail for violation of a protective order. He was of that mental mindset so that when he got out of jail, he went over, he killed his ex-wife, he killed his own kid, and then he killed himself to prove nobody's gonna tell me what to do. So if you picked him, you're absolutely right. Um, this face reading stuff, how it works, is both nature and nurture. So on the nature side, part of it is what you were born with. It's the inherited part. So you know, you can say, oh, come on, Mac, it's genetic. Look, this looks like my mother's eyes, there's my uncle's nose, that's my father's chin, those are my grandpa's ears. Absolutely. But you may have even heard in your family of origin, oh, you have your mother's optimistic outlook. You have your uncle's nose for business. You have your father's aggressive competitive drive. Are you just as independent as your grandpa? We just didn't know that some of these physical qualities and features that we have have characteristics that go with it that people respond to in a very specific or predictable way. That's only, that's only 40% because you can take identical twins. I mean, they're, they came from the same egg. And genetically, they're identical. And when they're little, they look alike, but go look at them when they're 50 and suddenly one of them's got a line the other one doesn't have, or one of them's ear sticks out and the other one doesn't. Because as their life experiences diverge, so does the impact on your face. Your face is the best metaphor you can possibly have for your mind, for what's going on with your mind. And you can see that all the time. Um, I, before I, I'm gonna teach y'all how to do this face reading, but I first wanna tell you why I think it's important. I've, I got into it for jury selection. And I had attorneys that said that they felt like they were committing malpractice if they didn't hire me to help them with their case. Uh, I've taught it to psychologists, psychotherapists, doctors, teachers, the FBI. Uh, I was talking to the uh, Automobile Theft Task Force, detectives from all over the state of Texas just a, a couple of months ago. Sales, uh, big corporations for hiring people, many applications, but that's still not the most important thing about face reading. What face reading has taught me is the most powerful representation of who I can ever be on this planet. My most effective self, my ability to actually make something happen, make a change, you know, close a sale, is my present moment, unguarded, authentic self. Now that is exactly the opposite of what I taught, was taught present moment. No, 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 Mac. You don't want to be in the present. You want to be in the future. You want to anticipate what's going to happen. You want to, don't want to be caught flat-footed. You want to see what's going on. But here's the problem. When I was telling you about these invisible waves that we all pick up on, everybody knows everything. They just don't consciously know it. And one of the things we know, we, we pick up on one another. When you're talking to another person, when you're interacting with another person, a lot of times we're not present. It's not our mental habit to be present, really. 
When you're driving your car, are you really thinking about driving your car? Are you doing a dress rehearsal for what you're gonna do when you get to where you're going? Are you thinking about where you just came from? Are you planning what's gonna, you know, most of the time our brain is running in some other little circuit. I mean, that's sort of a normal habit of mind. However, when you're interacting with another human being, if that's, what, if that's what's going on, if part of you is having that little uh, movie going on in your head, the dimmest bulb in the room can pick that up. And if you're not present with them, they're not gonna be present with you. So what happens is you smile and nod your head and you know, they're thinking about something else, you're thinking about something else, and nothing happens. Now I've gotta tell you, I've had the privilege on the lecture circuit of meeting some of the most incredible people I, I could ever possibly imagine. I'm talking about people who could walk into a room of a thousand, a thousand noisy people and a hush just falls over the crowd. And when they get up to speak, everybody's just sitting there in total rapt attention. And if you talk to anybody afterward, they say things like, he was looking at me the whole time. He was talking to me the whole time. It's like, what do these people have? What do these people have that give them such charisma, such power, such ability to connect? And what they have to a person is presence. And you say, but wait, I'm present, Mac. You know, I'm sitting in the chair, my lights are on, I'm present. I'm talk not talking about physical presence. What I'm talking about is, I don't care if they're talking to one person or a thousand people, they completely show up in that moment. There's nothing out, they're completely there uh, in their whole being. And people know that. I mean, that's, and that's one of those things that people know too. So it, it brings them out. I, I can't express enough about why this is important. You know, it, tomorrow, if we had a survey of everybody in here, what went on this morning, no two people would agree on the same thing. Because the past is just something that we record, record in our head. It's just sort of, you know, it's our individual recording of the movie that we, we've already been played. It's not, really, it's not really real. And what I mean by not being real, it's like you can't do anything in the past. You can't take any actions in the past or make anything happen in the past. It's already over with, it's done. The future is the same problem on the other end. You know, that's just a projection. You're, uh, what your hopes are, what you think might happen. But you never did anything in the future. If anything gets done, it's gonna happen right now. So the, the place where the action is, the place where you close the sale, where you connect with somebody, where you make something happen, is this moment right here. Now, what does that have to do with face reading? When you're reading somebody's face, you have to be present. Try picking up anything that you've got in front of you and try reading it but not be present. You won't know what you read. You, I mean, you, you have to show up and be there when you're reading something. So when you're reading somebody's face, even if you're doing it silently, you're present. And people know that. Like, wow, you look at me different. You know, you're different because they sense the fact that you're really present. The second thing I was telling you about unguarded. No, for an attorney, no, no, no. You want a, a titanium shield. You don't want to let them see you sweat. You want to be bulletproof. But here's the problem. We already know everything. And when you run into somebody's defensive shield, you instantly feel it. And if somebody's got up their protective armor, what do you do? I, don't, I, don't, I, I want protective armor too. I don't want to be here naked. So, you know, now you've got two walls you're trying to get through. I guarantee you, you will never ever get past that other person's defensive wall. That's just the goal, to get past their defensive shield. You will never get past their defensive shield as long as you've got your shield up. So the first thing you have to do is drop that armor. Now here's where face reading helps there. When you already know more about everybody in the room than they know about you, you don't have a need for having any armor up. I mean. They're the ones that need to be worried, not you. So hey, hey, you can totally relax. And when you can see people on, a, on that level, there's nobody to be afraid of because, I mean, the biggest rattlesnake in the room, you know he's a rattlesnake, so you know how far to step back to not get bit. So you don't, you don't have that problem either. And when you drop your defensive shield, something amazing happens. You can take the most guarded, rough, tough iron worker and drop a little baby in his arms, a baby who's totally defenseless, totally vulnerable, and that baby will dissolve his wall.
And in a minute, he's going, oh, goo, 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 aren't you cute, you know? And, and, and making it absolutely f- f- full of himself. And well, that's what I'm telling you. When we experience somebody who doesn't have armor or doesn't have a shield, we open up, we drop our shield. And so you have an opportunity for connecting without being like bumper cars. Finally, authentic. I don't know about y'all, but I wasn't encouraged to, when I was a kid to be authentic that much. It's like what I heard was, if you don't learn how to act, young man, I'm not taking you out in public anymore. Now you learn to straighten up and fly right or that is it for you. So, you know, the message I got was I needed to learn how to conform my behavior to make everybody else happy to be what they wanted them to be. And yeah, we need some of that. You certainly need to, kids certainly need to be socialized. But when you're interacting with another person, we can instantly spot when somebody's not authentic. We can spot a phony like that. I don't care how pleasant their facade is. Hi, how are you? Come on in here. Let me sell you a car. You know, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> so as soon as we feel their phoniness, you know, we wall them out. Now, here's the problem. If I said, be your authentic self, you couldn't do it. Because you would have to split yourself in two and one part of yourself check and see how the other part's doing. And then which one are you? You, You're this or this? You know, there's two of you, so obviously that's not your full authentic self. What's amazing, though, is when you're interacting with another human being and you put your complete, total focus and attention out there on them, you lose your sense of self. What I mean is that little internal self-critic that sits over your shoulders judging you all the time, like, did that sound stupid or do I look okay? That just disappears. You're not even aware of that. All you're aware of is the other person and what they're aware of is like, wow, he's real. Yeah, that, he's, yeah, he's solid, he's real, he's authentic. Now, why don't we do that? I mean, you sort of know that. Why don't we do that? Because most people are boring. Like, oh my God, you don't have to talk to this guy. But, but face reading makes everybody fascinating. You know that feeling you had when you were like uh, seven or eight or maybe five or six for some of you, where you learned how to read and you could go down the road and go, oh look, mom, Dallas, 24 miles. You know, the world kind of opened up for you. It's that same feeling multiplied by 6.4 billion. There is nobody on this planet who you can't connect with and there's nobody who's not interesting. I, I never stand in line anymore. I don't care, I'm at the grocery store, whoever's in front of me, and you know, I'll stand there for a minute, I go, wow, you got great ears. What? I say, yeah, you know, I read faces, your ears say that uh, you take in information best when you see it. Wow, what else can you see? And then actually start reading faces. So let's do a little bit of that. Let me have some volunteers up here for just a minute, change up the energy. I wanna show you how to read faces. And we'll use these people sorry, as our tool. Now, I promise you, I'm not gonna say ax murderer, so don't, don't be afraid, come on up. Um, okay, there's one. Now, I want some people to, uh, whose faces I haven't read yet. Come on up here. And uh, now, we want diversity, so we need some women up here. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm gonna read the rest of y'all's faces later on, so I just need about four or five right now. now hang on, just one second, let me see how many we got. I need to see what I do have right now. Okay, no, 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 no. Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, hang on just one second. Let's see what you got. All right. Now. Okay, that's probably enough. Um, yeah, step out here where they can see you. Yeah, I'll, I'll move out this way. I'll just move this side for just a second. Okay, now every single one of y'all is a face reader. So if I said to you, pick one of these people and write down everything you could say about them. Everybody in here could come up with two or three things. The most intuitive person in the room will come up with somewhere between seven and nine things. And if you ask the person who got the most, uh, to get feet, you know, took the person that got the seven or nine things and took their responses and told it to the subject, the subject goes, whoa, that was good. You only missed two. So seven, you missed two. That's where you were projecting your uncle onto them. Um, <laughs> If you could read faces though, this is the sort of stuff you could see. Now, I wanna look right quick because there's some things that I wanted to definitely look for, um, just so we had a little bit of variety. What we don't have, what I don't have 
is Bambi eyelids. I need somebody who has really big eyelids, whether, you know, where you would put, uh, got anybody out there who got big eyelids? <laughs> Bambi eyelids? Big eyelids, yeah, big eyelids. Not eyebrows, eyelids. <laughs> eyelids. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll, uh, well, uh, we'll, we'll work with what we got. You got some? Yeah. Like where you would put eyeshadow on if you were putting on eyeshadow. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. So, it would take me probably... 10 minutes a person, maybe longer than that, if I read everything I could see. On face reading, somebody asked me, is it always right? Well, uh, no, because, I mean, my computer's not always right, but I don't throw it away. Here's the reason, here's where we're gonna find the inaccuracy. If you stuck with the ones and the tens, if you looked on a person's face and you only read the ones and the tens on a person's face, you'd always be right. When you start reading fours, fives, and sixes, it's not gonna be as accurate. The information comes where you have the most expressive feature, the most uh, prominent feature. But if you've got something that matches the picture in the book exactly, guaranteed it's gonna be that way. Um, so let's look at Sarah for just a second. And I'll show you what kind of things you can see. And I'm also gonna talk to you about how to use this for sales while we're doing this. So the first thing I see about Sarah, she's got this wide space in between her eyebrows. Sarah has innate self-will. Ever since Sarah was a little girl, if she makes up her mind she's gonna do something or she makes up, makes up her mind she's not gonna do it, Dynamite's not gonna change it. You know, she's stuck on it. Yeah. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I see about Sarah, she has high eyebrows. Now raise your eyebrows up for just a second. How do you feel when you, it's like alarm. That's what you're doing with alarm. Now pull them down as low as you can. Like, yeah, let's get busy. Let's get focused on this. So high eyebrow people are people who are selective. They need time to make up their mind. Don't stampede them or rush them into a decision. They just need to see how they feel about it. Now here's what I see on Sarah. Sarah has high ears. And here's what I mean by high ears. The tops of her ears are higher or up is equal to her eyelid. If the bottoms of the ears were lower than the nose, those would be low ears. If you run into somebody who the bottom of their ears are lower than their nose and the tops of their ears are as high as their eyebrows, that's big ears. So you read that, that, <laughs> you read that different. <clears throat> but on Sarah, Sarah has small high ears. High ears, she takes in information very quickly, but high eyebrows, she still needs to see how she feels about it. So her challenge is sensory overload, getting too much information too fast. A good thing for you is don't let anybody stampede you. You need to go, ah, uh, oh, that sounds great, but let me call you back and give yourself enough time to see does that really feel right. In sales, you know, you know that you don't have to keep telling her over and over again, she got it the first time, but she's gotta have some time to match it up with her internal pattern recognition to see does it feel right. Now, I wanna tell you guys a warning. If you're in a relationship with somebody like Sarah that has these high eyebrows, they store things on an emotional tab. And what I mean by that, if you have a disagreement or an argument with them, I don't care if it's six months later or a year later, <laughs> when it comes up again, she's gonna go, you did too, you stood right there, you were wearing that blue shirt your mother gave her, that was the day we took to the dog to the vet, and, he's gonna, and you're gonna go, yeah, all she has to do is pull out the feeling and the whole thing comes back. Um, <laughs> Other things on Sarah, she's got these broad cheeks. She's an Energizer Bunny. She can just keep going and going and going. But she has, and broad jaws. Broad jaws, she has tenacity. But she has a small chin. Now I'm gonna help you guys out again. These broad cheeks and broad jaws on Sarah make her look like she's tough and strong, but this little chin, emotionally, she's like a delicate flower. She needs someone who's sweet with her, gentle with her, kind to her, doesn't criticize her, doesn't try to boss her around. If you're in a relationship with somebody with a small chin, what you need to know is criticism wounds them. It's like a knife in the heart. So what I'm telling you is, I don't, you know, you can't even come up with constructive criticism. You can't even say something like, honey, that was delicious, that was the best dinner I ever ate. But you know, I think mom puts paprika in it. Because you won't get to eat that dish again, you know. <laughs> and they don't take orders worth a damn. You have to say please and thank you. Um, other things that show up on Sarah, when she smiles, her gums show. It tells me in a relationship, she's a giver. The way she approaches a relationship is not what can I take, but what can I give. So she never wants the other person to feel like they got ripped off. Um, what's interesting about Sarah, this little line right here, these lines from the nose to the mouth are disappointment lines. When they cross the corners of the mouth, they're not just disappointment, they're grief, loss, and pain. Hers is on the right side. 
So what it tells me, Sarah hasn't been carried to glass on a feather pill and fed ice cream. She's got some grief, loss, and pain in her professional or business or external world side. So where she's facing stuff like, what's gonna happen? How am I gonna do it? You know, how am I gonna survive? But um, tension in her chin, she doesn't expect life's gonna be easy. Suits up every day like she's getting ready to go do battle. And she's got these small ears, she's visual. She takes in information best when she can see it. If you're trying to sell something to somebody with small ears, they, you gotta show them, you know, give them examples, show them the charts, they're visual. They take in information best when they can see it. What did I miss on you, Sarah? Okay, all right, well, you think about it. Now, let's look at Tom for just a second. First thing I see about Tom, Tom's ears stick out. Independent nonconformist does things his own way. My ears used to stick out just like that. Self-starter, sees what needs to be done, jumps in and does it. Tom, if you have to work with other people, it'd be good for you to learn to say things like, oh, yeah, I see what you mean now. Yeah, I hear where you're coming from. And then when they walk away, go ahead and do it exactly the way you were going to do it the first place. <laughs> make, them, make them feel better. Other things that show up about Tom, he's got that gap between his front teeth. In some countries, that's considered good luck. That's gumption. That's somebody that if life comes along and slaps him flat, he just peels himself off the pavement, gets back up and goes after it again. He's, a, he's like a Super Bowl, but he's got gumption. Uh, other things that show up on uh, Tom immediately, his nose, he has a high ridge on his nose. He works best when he can control his own pace and style of work. So this is how you can put the right person in the right job. Somebody who works independently, you know, can run their own show, do their own thing. There are people with high ridges on their nose. If, the, if there's not any ridge in the nose at all, if like one cheek flows into the other, these people need to work with other people. They need to be around other people or connect with people. Um, other things that show up on Tom, his front teeth hang down a little further than the ones on either side. Uh, stubborn, once he makes up his mind, somebody has to prove to him or show him that he's wrong. These two lines he's got in between his eyebrows there, he's too hard on himself. Takes himself by the collar and just makes himself do it whether he feels like it or not, just force himself to do it. Now, interesting thing about Tom, if you looked at the thirds of his face, the longest part is from his nose to his chin. Nose to his chin, he's earthy and grounded. High pressure cells will not work on him. He needs time to make up his own mind and he thinks best when he, he, thinks best when he can get up and walk around. So if, you, if this is the longest part on the person's face, you don't try to coop them up in their office. It's like, oh, let's go take a walk. You know, let's, on the golf course. You know, something where you can walk around and they think best when they're pacing. Now, the interesting thing about this is these people that have this long part in, from their nose to their chin, which is most athletes, um, often make good salespeople because like Nolan Ryan, for example, I take Advil, it helps me. You believe it. These people, we, they speak from the heart when they get around to saying what they think, it's like, yeah, that's really right. Um, let's look at Larry for just a second. Very accurate. Very accurate. Okay, I forgot to ask, he says very accurate. Uh, Larry's getting ripped off. <laughs> Not by other people, but by himself. And here, take your glass off just a second, Larry. Here's what I'm looking at. If you look at Larry's eyes, you can see that this lid on the right side is hanging down. That's not old age, it's not allergies, it's not genetics, and it's not because his grandpa had an eye like that. This is from putting so much life force, life energy, and life effort out there externally on everything else and everybody else that he's ignored his own needs for rest, relaxation, joy, happiness, comfort, peace, diet, or exercise. I You know, I told you, uh, uh, when I was first learning face reading, I started that company with a friend of mine. She worked for IBM at the time. She had, she had eyes like that on both sides. Never saw any eyelids on her in my whole life. Uh, IBM downsized her, which is a polite way of saying they fired her. But uh, she had a severance package she got to take off and started a garden and took a walk every morning, changed up her diet. In about three months time, when she started taking better care of herself, you know, made, putting more attention on her, she got eyelids. First time I saw eyelids on this lady in my whole life. Then she opened up her own business, just like Larry, the eyelid on the right side disappeared again. Just went back in that damn mode. Uh, wide cheeks, Energizer Bunny, he can just keep going and going and going. Full cheeks, consensus builder, ability to get other people to join in with you, get them on your bandwagon. You know, if we had to send out for pizza and get everybody in here to agree on one flavor, I'd put him in charge of that committee. Uh, tension in his chin, doesn't expect life's gonna be easy. He suits up every day like he's getting ready to go do battle. This little line on his chin, uh, he's an overachiever. Now, here's what I mean by that. If you got feedback growing up that sounded something like, settle down there, don't be a show off, nobody likes a braggart, if you're good, they'll tell you, and you took that in, then when you grow up, 
the way you get validation of proof is you do so much, other people go, God, Larry, you're amazing. How'd you do that? But here's what you need to understand. Any of you ladies who are in a relationship with somebody like Larry that's got this line on their chin, fall down and thank your lucky stars. My God, they're an overachiever. But here's what you need to know. When they're flying high, they're unstoppable. You can't touch them. When they hit the wall, run into a snag, they're not their own best cheerleader. That's where they need you. Not from the whole world, one person's enough, but they need at least one person in this world unconditionally on their side. Somebody that can pick them up when they hit the wall. You know, because they're not their own best cheerleaders. They, they, they dwell on what they didn't do or should have done. So it's like, uh, oh God, nobody could have done that. You're smarter than those guys. We'll figure it out. But if they've got that, absolutely unstoppable. Larry's got a nice straight mouth, good, clear, reflective listener. Way listens doesn't make things better than the person said or worse than the person said. These lines in the bridge of his nose, these little fine lines, disgustingly responsible. If Larry ever tells somebody he's gonna do something, it's the same as somebody else saying they're gonna sign a contract. Now they have to do it, they force himself to do it. Um, Larry's got small ears, takes in information best when he can see it, and he's got those angled eyebrows. So he commands respect, you know, when he says, we're gonna do it like this, your angled eyebrows part of what gives you the authority, and he's got jowls. Now, when I'm talking to women's groups, I never use that word. <laughs> what I say when I'm talking to women's groups is power pouches. You know, these are power pouches. <laughs> but if you, if you took two people and put them up here, one with power pouches and one without power pouches, and had them say about the same thing, and then took a survey of the room, the one with the power pouches will always win. Now, some of you ladies may at some time have felt like that you got discriminated against, like you got overlooked, that the, the guy got the raise and you'd been there longer, or you, he, they got a promotion and you, you, you deserved it. Now, and your response was, that's sexism. You know, I'm not saying there's not sexism, but there's something worse than sexism. Jowlism. And the reason it's worse is because nobody even knows what they're doing. So, you know, the guy who's trying to make the decision, he's going like, I'm going with him. And what he picked was jowls. So any of you ladies who feel like that, you know, you're bumping your head on that glass ceiling when you're trying to climb the corporate ladder, maybe the thing you need to do is go get you some gel implants. You know, for purposes of corporate advancement, you've been putting those implants in the wrong place, you know. <laughs> I'm teasing you. I don't mean for you to really get gel implants. I just be proud of what you do have. Don't be thinking there's something wrong with you when you start to get some authority. And look at it. Uh, you know, when, uh, when uh, Marlon Brando was going to play The Godfather, he put those jowl implants in. Or look at uh, some ladies who don't have that problem. Janet Reno, Margaret Thatcher, Mar Madeleine Albright. They have enough power pouch that when they say, Buster, you're doing it like this, people go, okay. And so you don't even have to raise your voice. Your face speaks louder than anything that ever comes out of your mouth. Um, broad cheeks, Energizer Bunny, big jaws, tenacity that won't quit. And a driver. These lines in his ears, the way that uh, Larry's me measures success is by setting goals and accomplishing the goal. But every time he succeeds, he just bumps the bar up. Like, heck, if I can do that, I can do this. So he's in competition with himself. what I miss on you, Larry? <laughs> <laughs> power dimples. The way he's powerful is encouraging other people and lifting them up. Leads from the bottom up. What's your name? Nancy? Nancy? Yep. Nancy, Nancy just got the opposite. Close set cheeks, tremendous energy for short bursts. Nancy can go like a barn on fire for three or four hours. If she, she can get it up to meet a deadline. <laughs> Problem is she hates working with slow people, stupid people and plotters. It's like, oh my God, just let me do it. I'll go do it. Um, straight chin goes all out for her goals, causes and ideas. Um, small chin though, doesn't need criticism. She already knows everything that's wrong with her. Uh, it's got these lids hanging down. She's pushing herself way too hard too. So these lids hanging down, it's like your nature telling you, go find something that you really love doing. I'm not saying quit your job, but find something that renews your life energy, your life source. Um, Nancy's bottom teeth are like mine. She holds herself to impossibly high standards. She hates being wrong, double checks herself to make sure she's not. Her thin nose, self-reliant and self-sufficient. Uh, so, uh, somebody says, Nancy, you need some help? No, I'm fine, I got it, I'll do it, I got it, no problem. Uh, these lines right here, she's also got those power dimples. And the most beautiful thing I see on Nancy's face, these little lines right here on her upper lip mean more to me than if she told me she had a PhD in psychology. Because those are survivor lines. You get those when you get hit with stuff that's like, 
almost kills you, but not quite, where you literally had to pull yourself back from what felt like a bottomless black pit. But you did it. And in doing that, it gave you a greater depth and awareness than anything else you could have gotten in life. Now, no matter what life throws at you from here on out, you're like, already handled worse than that. When everybody else is having a blue Monday, you're like, get over it. It could be worse. <laughs> yeah. um, shows up here too. These are courage months. So your face is always a self-diagnostic. It always will tell you two or three times the same sort of thing going over and over again. What did I miss on you, Nancy? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Okay, uh, Rich. First thing I see about Rich. Um, first, the first thing is his forehead. He's got lots of forehead. Um, <laughs> Good with logic, theory, planning, academics, loves distinctions. So if the longest part of the person's face is from, you know, the hairline or where it should be to the eyebrows, these are people that need distinctions. You gotta show them how what you guys better than what they got. You know, I need to hold it in my hand, I need to see it, I need to compare it for myself. Uh, raise your eyebrows for just a second. Those lines on his forehead are Einstein lines. Pumped iron with his left brain, worked hard on stretching and developing his intellect. Broad nose, he's a provider. If somebody's under his umbrella, they're covered for life. Um, what also shows he's got these major eye puffs. Now you've gone to the point now, if you push too far, if you just keep putting your energy out there and ignoring your own needs, there's a place where there's a sort of a danger zone where you wake up one day and go, nobody ever did anything for me. Well, I'm just gonna take care of myself. And then you focus everything on yourself. Um, so don't let it go too far. There was deep set eyes, looks relaxed, rich looks relaxed and laid back. He's not, his mind's moving a mile a minute. He's checking every single thing out constantly. When you talk to him, he'll sit back in his chair and nod his head. Doesn't mean a damn thing. That's just polite. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, what's your name? Bill. Bill. So the first thing I see about Bill, he's got this little pad right here. That's a, a wheel pad. Uh, Troy Aikman's got one of those. This is like, you know, you can break Troy's collarbone. He's gonna still try to go for the touchdown. So this is a self wheel pad. Uh, other things that show up about Bill, his ears sit on his head at an angle. He marches to the sound of his own drum. So if it's right for him, that's exactly what he's going to do. Um, longest part of his face is like from his nose to his chin. So don't coop him up. He needs to walk around and he should be able to see out. Um, other things too, he's got warrior cheeks. He's got energy for sustained long haul effort, whatever it takes to, to get the job done. And he's developed some jowls. So, you know, when you speak now, your words carry weight. A uh, nice straight mouth, good clear reflective mirror. You know, this is, I gotta tell you, I guess you're the sample here, Larry. This job must be hard. Boy, there's a lot of people with these eyelids hanging down, you know? Uh, but, but also a giver. Now, these, his gums showing tell me that uh, in relationships, you know, he, he's, uh, it's easier for him to give than receive. He doesn't want the other person to ever feel like he ripped them off. So uh, he's a giver. Um, and the other interesting thing about Bill, the way his forehead and nose come together, there's a whole bunch of people up in the Metropolitan Art Museum down in the basement that look like that. They were Greek and Roman generals. The reason they made them generals is because they could take a thought or an idea and make it happen. So that's what Larry's gift is, is being able to turn an idea into an actuality and make it happen. What did I miss on you? That's pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, come over this way just a second. What's your name? Glenda. Glenda. Is that right? Glenda. Glenda. Have you ever heard the expression, boy, you've been keeping your nose to the grindstone? Now, now, you know, why, why would we talk about mutilating a body part for somebody who's a hard worker? Well, if you put your nose to the grindstone, you'd wind up with a small nose. Glenda has a small nose. What it tells me is she has a capacity for hard work. Not that she likes it. It's just that truthfully, she can get it done before she can explain to somebody else how to do it. So she says, I'll just do it. I'll do it. I'll, 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 I'll take care of it. Um, other things that show up about her too, these two lines right here, she's too hard on herself. She's taken herself by the collar and just made herself do it whether she felt like it or not. Develop some authority when you speak. Now your words carry weight. And like Nancy there, depth. You know, these lines here, grief, loss, pain. I mean, and, and where you had to really pull yourself back and find out what you were made of, but you did it. Um, round chin, you get down to acting on things. You put people first. Once again, pushing way too hard. These lids hanging down. So I mean, I guess you have to you have to go, you have to be, you're going to be in this, this group, you have to push. Um, and here's what's interesting about you. This year actually sticks out more than this one. So you've developed your own sense of uh, who you are and independence as you've gotten older. You know, so now you're uh, more independent than you were even when you were a kid. What did I miss on you? Not a thing. Not a thing. Okay. And, and come over here. Let's see what we, <clears throat> take your glasses off for just a second. 
Yeah, uh, not, not exactly Bambi eyelids, but I was gonna help you out. If you run into somebody who's got these great big eyelids, and I read some of them last night, so I know there's some in this room, like where you would put uh, eyeshadow on, what that's about is somebody that has a high capacity for intimacy. They want a partner. Now you're, you're on that scale, you know, she's got big eyelids, but they're closer on the, like five, four, five or six rather than the, than the 10. Um, wants a partner. How, here's what I wanna help you guys out with. What you need to understand. When they commit, they totally commit. That's the good news and the bad news. Because, you know, hey, good news, she's gonna be there. Bad news, she's gonna be there, you know? <laughs> so, here's what you need to understand. If you're in a relationship with a woman who's got these big eyelids, uh, she has a very high level of loyalty and commitment, and if you don't live up to her level of loyalty and commitment, she's not gonna get rid of you. She's just gonna punish you until you do. So, you, <laughs> so you know, you better get your act together. Um, so, what's your name again? Stephanie. Stephanie? So the first thing I see about Stephanie, she's got eyebrows. Now, first of all, let's talk about eyebrows for just a second. What are these things? I mean, I know they're eyebrows, but why as creatures do we have hairy patches over our eyes? I mean, like, they don't keep the sweat out of your eyes. They don't keep the sun out of your face. Why do we have these patches over our eyes? These are signalers. They've gone around the entire world and they film people greeting each other. The universal human greeting is we smile and we raise our eyebrows for two-tenths of a second. So part of that 400 billion times a second that your brain's firing is plugged into eyebrows. Eyebrows can tell you how to approach somebody. So here's the things that we can see from here. Um, round eyebrows, here we go. Don't, I don't want you to go anywhere. Round eyebrows are people whose mental focus is people-oriented. So if you're trying to sell something to somebody with round eyebrows, they need a personal example. Like, oh yeah, I got one of these. This is wonderful. You know, I love this. My brother got one. But you know, a, a, an endorsement would be very helpful. People with straight eyebrows, like Rich here, want facts. So he doesn't care if it worked for somebody else. He wants to know for himself. He wants to hold it in his hand. He wants to see it for himself. Show me the facts. Show me the data. Show me the proof. Larry's got angled eyebrows. Neither one of those approaches work. He wouldn't even come up and start talking to you unless he already had something uh, in his mind. So the best approach to take with somebody with angled eyebrows is, well, well what do you think? And let him, let him tell you first before you start trying to pump something over on him. So, you know, just to, just to know that, just to be able to get on that wavelength with somebody. Um, what also Stephanie has, this little cupid's bow in her upper lip, it's wonderful. On a subconscious level, it directs people's attention back to her mouth. Now, I wanna tell you, people actually believe more in your face than anything that comes out of your mouth. You walk up to somebody and go, huh, I'm sorry you guys lost the game. It's like, no, you're not. Or you can take a little kid and with your most pleasant voice, say, come here, honey, let me give you a hug, but put a mean look on your face. No, because uh -uh. we, what we really trust in is faces. So this little cupid's bow on her lip on a subconscious level directs people's attention back to her mouth. Now, I want to tell you ladies, if you have to get up in front of a group and talk to them, and you don't already have one of these, hey, little well-placed lipstick, hey, you got one too. So, now I haven't noticed that the lipstick trick worked as good for guys, but you know, it, it definitely worked on the women. Um, another thing about Stephanie, she's got this little line on her chin. I'm gonna help you guys out again. We were talking about overachievers. You've got the same thing Larry has. But here's where male and female is a little different. Yes, she's definitely an overachiever. She definitely does more than she needs to. She does so much, other people go, wow, that's great. But I'm warning you guys, if you're in a relationship with some woman that's got this line on her chin, she needs proof of desirability. Emotionally, she's sort of like a bucket with a hole in it. And it's your job to never let the bucket run dry. And it's not that hard to do. Uh, you know, you can't play the John Wayne strong silent type with her. You can't go, ah, she knows she's beautiful. She knows she's brilliant. Heck, I think I told her that when we got married. You know, no, that bucket went dry. So if you're in a relationship with somebody like Stephanie who's got this little line on her chin, I don't care if, if she's going with you, I don't care if you're going to the 7-Eleven. When your hand touches that front door handle, she's with you, you go, you look good. You look good. Those three words really aren't for her, they're for you. Your whole day will go better if you keep that bucket filled up. <laughs> Best dinner I ever had, honey. Boy, I'm glad you picked this restaurant. This is a wonderful vacation. Those little things like that are not throwaway lines. They need that. Uh, full of cheeks is a consensus builder, ability to get other people on a bandwagon. Stephanie's sensitivity is off the chart. 
She walks into a room, she picks up on vibes, which is kind of a blessing and a curse because she feels everything, not just the good stuff, but everything. Where I see that, she's got this little line on her cheek. That you, rhinoceroses don't get that line. You know, if you're bowling through life, stomping on people, then you don't get that line. Hers is on the left side, so it tells me she's experiencing her personal side intense grief, loss, pain, like the loss of a loved one or loss of a child, something of that magnitude. The wonderful thing about it though, is that it gives her perspective, it gives her depth. I call those compassion lines. So Stephanie's truly a wounded healer. When she says to somebody, oh girl, I know what you're going through. You really do, you know, they, they really, I mean, your face reflects more than anything that comes out of your mouth. Little dimple on the tip of her nose, routine sucks the life out of her. Doing the same thing over and over again, she needs something you can throw your heart into, something you can get excited about and then move on. I was telling you about eyebrows. So here's how you read eyebrows. If you imagine that thought started right here in the center, just for purposes of metaphor, and moved out this way, the person's eyebrow pattern growth will tell you how they process thought. So when I'm looking at Stephanie, her eyebrows start out real thick, and then they get thin as they go across. So what it tells me about Stephanie is she needs to be on the planning committee. She sees the big ideas, the potentials, the possibilities, what could be, but then as time marches on, it's like, yeah, I'm sort of bored with that, you know? So the details, the wind up, follow through, clean up, the carry out the trash, that's not nearly as interesting to you as getting it going, getting it started. Here's what's important. Like if you're trying to sell some, something to somebody who has Stephanie's eyebrows, if I was trying to sell her a house, I wouldn't start out with the warranty deed and the contract. I'd start out with, boy, you could put a swimming pool out there. Man, that'd be a great place for a deck. But the potentials and possibilities, what could be? Because they're visionaries. Um, if it was the opposite, let's see who's got the opposite. Um, Rich has even eyebrows. He sees all the related aspects quickly and easily. So, you know, you show him A, he's at Z. You see everything uh, immediately. Um, Nancy has thin eyebrows. Thin eyebrows, a little sensitive, uh, especially to criticism. So if I'm trying, if, with Nancy, the first thing I would say is, oh, I love that necklace, you, that's gorgeous. But to know instantly, I'm not her critic. To immediately establish that I'm not criticizing you. I don't, I don't find anything wrong with you. Um, Larry's got even eyebrows. Now, the challenge is with even eyebrows, learning how to develop a tolerance for other people's inability with detail because you can feel like they're trying to be intentionally stupid or slow. So, you know, that's a challenge. If you also look at Larry, his eyes bulge out a little bit. If you look from the side, his eyes are bulging out. Here's what you need to understand. Those people like to be involved. They like to be included. They're willing to listen to what you have to say. But when it's his turn to, when it's his turn to talk, do not interrupt him. That's how to piss him off, you know. It's like, you had your turn, now it's my turn. So, um, eyebrows, really light colored eyebrows that you have a hard time seeing are chameleons. They can fit in anywhere. I run into those with uh, attorneys sometimes that, you know, they're wonderful negotiators because you don't know where they're coming from. So you wind up telling them everything. Um, thank you. What did I miss on any of you? Isn't it amazing? I mean, the people you don't know from Adam that you can know so much about them. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'm glad you didn't mention the axe murder. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so far, you felt like there's some guy up on the stage, he just keeps blabbing on and on, won't stand still. And as long as I sit out here and keep my hand down and don't volunteer, I'll be safe. <laughs> no. You cannot not communicate. You're communicating every single second whether you realize it or not. And what's really been going on Every single one of you in this room has been carrying on a conversation with me. And this is what it looked like. When we're receptive to what the other person has to say, our eyes open up to let in more light. The way that your eyes open up to let in more light is this bottom lid gets relaxed, round, or curved. So if you're talking to somebody and you're seeing round bottom lids, they're at least letting the guard down enough to let the information in. It doesn't mean they're agreeing with you completely, but they're at least being receptive. They're at least letting it in. Any of you who've ever done any public speaking, if you notice how you instantly run to certain faces in the crowd, what you didn't know you were doing, you were running to the round bottom lids. You were running to the people who were giving you that invisible feedback of acceptance. When actually, it's the flat bottom lid people that need your attention. Because if you're talking to somebody and as you're talking to them, you suddenly see those bottom lids go flat or straight, 
something just happened. Like the rock being thrown in the pond, at that very instant, neurons fired in their brain and they have become wary, suspicious, guarded, or judgmental. Most likely judgmental. And you can look closer and see why. If it goes flattest on the left, they become wary, suspicious, guarded, or judgmental personally, probably about you. Like, I don't know if I trust you. That's a great thing to know, to be able to say exactly at the moment that they had the thought, hey, I know you don't know me, but here, I sold one of these to Bob. Let's call Bob. Here's Bob's number. Ask Bob how his thing's working. And you've just addressed the problem. How can I trust you? So an endorsement, you know, a, a reference from somebody else will solve the problem. If it goes flattest on the right, they don't trust your data or information. I know it sounds too good to be true, but look, here's the proof, here's the statistic. Let me show you how it works. And so you can immediately address what's going on when it happens. To know when something happens in a person's mind is as important as knowing what. Um, here's the other important thing about this. You think that people don't know what's going on. Everybody knows everything. They just don't know they know it. And one of the things we know, we know instantly when we're being judged. So this piece of information, people are already aware of. Not on a conscious level, on a subconscious level. And what happens when we feel judged? We put our defenses up. We judge them back. So some of the things that people have told me is like, well, Mac, I, you know, I don't think I could do that face reading stuff because, you know, I was taught it's impolite to stare. <laughs> but when you are staring, you are judging. You are comparing the person you're seeing now with something in your subconscious data bank. You know, you're checking it out. You're judging. When you're reading faces, you're not judging. I read every single face I see. I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting in a restaurant and I'm looking at somebody across the restaurant and they come up and go, don't I know you? Because the look that was on my face wasn't one of judgment, but one of acknowledgement, one of recognition. So, well, if he recognized me, I must know him. So, you know, you can, you can see that immediately. Um, I told you this is something that y'all are suffering from. When you're pushing uh, yourself too hard, when you're driving yourself over the limit, making yourself do it. Now, I want to tell you ladies, I can save you thousands of dollars. Before you rush out to see a plastic surgeon to try to get uh, your eyes fixed, here's something that you could do. Go over to your calendar, mark off one day of every week, and on that day, give yourself a space of time, like three hours, where you attend to yourself, where you fill your bucket back up with something that gives you life energy or life for, uh, joy. Um, and I don't mean go shopping for the family. I'm talking about doing something for yourself. Now, and I, what I mean is, too, that if somebody calls you up and says, oh, gosh, really, could you help me out? To be able to say to them, I'd love to help you, but I've got an appointment and your appointments with yourself and keep that appointment just like you'd keep a doctor's appointment. If you do that, you'll start to get your lids back. When you start to realize that it really works, you know, you'll, you'll do it more. Um, if you push past too far and it gets to where you have these intense puffs, uh, that's to the point where you're starting to need some psychological intervention because these are people that have just pushed themselves so far and so long that they get to the point where like, ah, I'm just gonna take care of myself. I don't care what happens to anybody else anymore. Um, small irises. I was talking to a group up in Chicago called Challenger Gray and Christmas. Uh, they're an they're a, uh, outplacement firm. And outplacement, what they do in outplacement is they uh, find jobs for people who were making 100000 to 300000 a year, a job because the company wants those people that they let go of to move on and not think about suing them, you know, get them on out. So uh, I was sent up there by the sales staff. The executive vice president who was in charge of the counselors, the people who actually worked with the people to get their resumes going, was totally underwhelmed by the thought of some attorney from Texas coming up and talking to her once a year conference on facials. So she gave me that slot that all speakers die for, the last four hours of their four day conference after everybody's beat up and wore out and ready to run off screaming. They kept me five hours though. 
And she called me up afterward and she said, um, Mac, I, I'm sorry, I have to apologize to you. She said, I thought you were gonna ruin our conference, but she said, you know, of all the things we did, the only thing that the counselors are talking about is the face reading. So they've started to open up and connect with people. And she said, you know, you were absolutely right. She said, I don't look at anybody the same way. She said, here's what I did. She said, I, I took your book and I went through and she said, I looked up my own face. And when I looked at my own face, I was like, wow, that's right, that's me. And then she said what happened was when she went out in the world, instead of seeing old people or young people or black people or Hispanic people or doctors, lawyers or Indian chiefs, what she saw and said was, that's like my nose. And if you can find, once you read your own face and you know what it means, whenever you see that on somebody else, you know that y'all share something in common. You know that you've got a connector. You've got something that, that connects. I was talking to a group called Payment Tech uh, a while back. It was their top sales uh, managers. And uh, before I said a thing, one of these guys says, oh, that, you know, I, I already know all about sales. I already know how to do it. He says, here's what I do. He says, I walk into the guy's office. If I see he's got a fish over, the, over his wall, I start talking about fish. Uh, if he's got a picture of his family on his desk, I start talking about my family. Uh, if he's, uh, you know, if I see his golf clubs in the corner, I start talking about golf. I say, well, what do you do if you meet him in that restaurant? Huh. With face reading, you've always got a connector. You've always got a way of understanding how to bridge that gap and to connect. So anyway, um, she said she set her mother, her sister, and her best friend down, and she started going over their faces. Now, here's the way to use this book. What she did... She would look through the book, she would match the picture to the person's face, and then she would read what was beside it. And then she would ask them for their feedback. And then she would write in the book what they said. Now those memory experts that will teach you that the way to memorize something is to double code it, to have two different ways you're holding it in your mind. So by doing that, you're double coding it and you don't have to remember the book anymore. You can remember, though, the guy I met in the restaurant or the guy I met at the grocery store. So you have a way of like double coding it so you can remember it. She said, Mac, you know, I found stuff about my own mother I didn't know. She said, I was reading my mother's face, and she said her mother said, oh, honey, yeah, I never told you about that, but she went, Mom, wow. So, I mean, who do you know better than your own mother? Um, then she started carrying her book around with her. Now, I want to tell you, if you want to be a closet face reader, you're never going to be very good at it. Like, uh, uh, just a minute. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> now, I mean, it, it just... You, Play with it. The best way to do this is play with it. The main reason you want to do it is this is fun. This is more fun than anything you played with it. I got to warn you. I mean, that's only fair. I taught my sister face reading and um, kind of caused a little problem because um, she's never bought herself a drink since. So she walks into the bar and she goes up to somebody and she looks at them and says something about their face. And they say, what? And then she reads her face and goes, Oh my God, that's amazing. And then the next person says, oh, do me, do me. And she said, well, buy me a drink. And then after that, you know, then, then they, think, they think if they buy her a drink, they'll get her face red. So she's got, you know, 10 beers sitting in front of her. And, like, it's, it's kind of dangerous. Be careful with it. Um, anyway, uh, my friend I was telling you that uh, uh, was the executive uh, vice president of this corporation, she said, uh, she called me up about, I guess it was about a month after she had uh, had the class, she said, Mac, I've already got my first amazing. She said, I was in the airport the other day and I was uh, talking to this guy and said something about face reading. He said, nah, come on. You can't tell anything about somebody from their face. Uh, you're born with your face. She said, well, you don't care if I try, do you? He said, nah, knock your lights out. It's not gonna work. So she started reading his face. She read a little more. She read a little more. And suddenly he went, my God, that is amazing. Now tell me what's in my suitcase. <laughs> Uh, but I brought her up for a different reason. She uh, had over 2 million frequent flyer miles on Delta alone because she was traveling around the country all the time. So airplanes was a great place for a captive audience. So she's sitting on the airplane, sitting there with her book, waiting for her next victim. Sure enough, uh, here comes this big guy getting on the plane. He looks like he's probably a CEO, president of a company, you know, big, powerful guy. As he's getting in over the top of her, he said, face reading, what's that? He said, I never heard of that. She said, well, fit, sit down here, I'll read your face. So he sat down and she took one look at him. She said, what I see on your face over and over again is power. Power is what shows up in your face. She said, the first thing you see, you got that big tall forehead. You're good with logic, theory, planning, academics, and love distinctions. Next thing I see, you've got those Einstein lines. 
So you pumped iron with your left brain. You've worked hard on stretching and developing your intellect. Next thing I see, you've got these angled eyebrows. That's another source of power. You stay mentally in control. And those angled eyebrows, people don't jack with you. And you go, okay, we're gonna do it like this. And it's like, okay, yes, sir. Um, next thing, said, uh, you got these broad cheeks. You're an energizer bunny. You can just keep going and going. She said, boy, those jaws on you, you don't even have bulldog jaws. You have snapping turtle jaws. You know, once you lock on, you don't like go to it thunders. Big chin. Now, uh, chins are about your assertiveness, aggressiveness, or competitiveness. I was on a plane one time, and I was sitting next to a, one of these biological engineers. He said, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. He said, uh, he said, actually, chin size is dictated by testosterone levels at certain stages of fetal development. And, you know, what's testosterone but a hormone that controls aggression, competition, or drive? Anyway, she says, a big chin, you know, uh, not afraid of competition. Um, actually, the person with the biggest chin can usually get the last word. That's why you can't get the last word with Jay Leno. He just out chins you. There's too much chin going on there. Um, <clears throat> big nose. Said you'll never do well as a PI. You need to make a major contribution. You, you know, you can't stand somebody looking over your shoulder. And uh, what you do has to have some kind of impact. Then she got excited. Because she looked at this guy and she noticed he had tiny little irises. And she hadn't got to read small irises before. So, hey, this was the first sighting. She was going to get to write in her book. So she looked it up in her book and she said, huh. Now, despite all that stuff I told you about power, what it says here is you're extremely sensitive. In fact, it says you've always been sensitive. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, wait. Here's the important part. It says because of your sensitivity, you may be allergic to anyone raising their voice or yelling at you. And she looked over at this big, powerful guy, this CEO, this corporate giant, and he's sitting there and he's got tears just rolling out of his eyes and down his cheek. And the first thing he says to her is, my wife yells all the time. She yells the cat, she yells the dog, she yells the kids, and I don't think I can take it anymore. <laughs> now, you laugh about that, but that, that's really kind of a miracle. I mean, you know corporate America. Who could the CEO really tell that to? You think you could talk to a psychologist or psychiatrist? Can you imagine if that got out? Hey, did you hear? Oh, Big John's cracking up. He's seeing a shrink. You think he could go to his managers and say, uh, wow, when my wife's yelling, boy, that really? no. And he obviously didn't tell her, so what did he do? He did what every single person in this room at one time or another has done. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to deal with that. He suppressed it. Now, here's the problem. Your brain does work a lot like a computer. And what I mean by that, you know, if you put something on your computer and then you don't touch it, as long as the machine still works, you could leave it in there 10 years and pull it back up, there it is, just the way you left it. The difference between a computer and your brain, though, is it never stops running. The program is constantly running. So those things that we put in and we suppress are still in there affecting your sense of self-worth, your sense of joy, your sense of accomplishment. All those things are being run by these subconscious programs. Now, when you bring something up and look at it, you change it. Your brain is sort of like that thing on your computer that says, do you want to save all changes? Your brain always chooses yes. So when you access something and bring up something that you've had suppressed, you add in all the new information that you've acquired since the last time it happened. So there's, there's a healing that takes place. There's a change that takes place. Every single time that you have one of these unguarded, present moment, authentic interactions with somebody, where you give them an opportunity to be self-revelatory, there's a healing that takes place that changes your relationship with them forever. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, she said she was walking through the streets of Chicago and she heard somebody going, Ann, Ann. And she's going, this is Chicago. There's probably five people right around me named Ann. Won't stop. Ann. Finally, she turns around and looks. It was the guy from the airplane dragging two of his buddies across the street as fast as he could and said, oh, I want you to meet this incredible lady. Because in that 10-minute conversation, she connected. When you have one of these present moment, unguarded, authentic interactions with somebody, there's a shift that occurs where you stop being the other and you become an us. There's a shift that occurs that creates a completely different dynamic in your relationship with the other person. It's like, oh no, he's my guy, I'm sticking with him. So that's, what this is, this is, that's what's available with face reading, this, that uh, capacity for connection. Um, 
I promised you that you would read faces before the time you left here. So let's talk about just some of the basic rules right quick, go through it real fast. First of all, uh, when you're reading somebody's face, you have to make sure that their chin is parallel with the floor, uh, that they don't have their chin up or chin down, or you're not looking up or down at them because chin up makes your ears look lower, chin down, chin down makes it look, ears look higher. So you wanna look at them straight on. The next thing you wanna do is uh, on a scale of one to 10, you know, look for ones and tens. You know, like the reason I, uh, I say look for what, how it, the face responds to light is because if I say look what, for what's prominent, you just go for big. And small can mean just as much as big can mean. Um, finally, dividing the face into thirds. If the largest part of the face is from the hairline to the eyebrows, uh, this is the longest part, good with logic, theory, planning, academics, love distinctions. You know, how you picked out the guy who was the, the uh, science and math teacher over the football coach. If the longest part of the person's face is from their eyebrows to the bottom of their nose, status. Uh, think about every king and queen of England for as far back as you wanna go, the longest part of their face is their nose. If I'm trying to sell something to somebody that this is the longest part of their face, I appeal to status. Oh, there's only two people in the whole state with this kind of model. Man, no, this is the brand, this is the newest thing out. Nobody, nobody else has got one of these. So status, quality, you know, somebody that has the best. If the longest part of the person's face is from their nose to their chin, they're earthy and grounded, but high pressure cells won't work on them. They need time to make up their own mind. So walk around with them, you know, let's, let's walk, let's talk. Uh, when they do get around to saying what they think, it comes across with real sincerity though. Okay, so we think and talk in terms of our upper face, we act in terms of our lower face. So from the nose up, it's gonna tell you how the person thinks and how they talk about it. From the nose down, it's gonna tell you what they're gonna do about it. Um, let's look at these. You can know one thing on a person's face and you already have more information about them than the most psychic person in the room. I'll, uh, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. I, uh, I went to take my driver's uh, license renewal test the other day and they said, read line three. And I, I don't see a line three. Oh, you have to go get your eyes checked. Oh, okay, so. So um, uh, I, uh, uh, when I went to get my eyes checked, who comes out of the doctor's office but one of my former students? He goes, oh, Mac Fulfer, wow. I'm, I'm Matt Ball, he said, I took your class uh, at TCU uh, a couple of years ago on improving odds in relationship. He said, I gotta tell you what happened. He said, man, I had had such a terrible time in relationships, you know? I said, I'd get in a relationship and then start going and I think, oh, if I have to live with this person the rest of my life, I'll cut my throat. And then it was so painful to get out of the relationship. So he said, I was about to give up. So he said, I, I saw in the TCU bulletin that you were offering this class. So I went to take the class. He said, but here, he said, I did something a little different. He said, I knew that obviously I wasn't any good at picking out the right people. So he said, what I did, instead of trying to read people, he said, what I did, I went through the book and he said, I looked over here for all the qualities I was looking for in my ideal woman. And he said, then I'd look over here to see what that looks like. So he said, I put together this mosaic of my ideal woman. He said, uh, I went back to work. I was telling the guys at work, like, I'm gonna know her when I see her. Uh, yeah, I'm perfectly on. And he said it actually came in handy because his annual review came up. And when he went in for his annual review, the whites were showing beneath his boss's eyes. He said, uh, uh, let's, don't, let's don't do this today. Let's, let's, let's pick another day. <laughs> but um, he, was, uh, he was asked to go down to uh, visit his sister who lived down in Houston. And uh, he wasn't too excited about going to his older sister's dinner party, but she was having a dinner party. And who walked in but his ideal woman? He said she was perfect. Had every single thing I was looking for except the eyebrows. He had visionary eyebrows where he saw the big idea and possibility. So he was looking for somebody who could do the detail and follow through. But he said, except for the eyebrows, she was perfect. And he said, normally when I meet somebody I'm attracted to, the more attracted I am to them, you know, the more nervous I am. So it's harder for me to say anything. So he said, I just walked up to her and I said, you know, you have an amazing face. She said, what? She said, well, I read faces and you just have an amazing face. Really? What does it say? Well, she was the prototype, you know? I mean, she was the person that, so he just started, he just started spitting out all the things that, you know, he'd been looking for. And she went, no, your sister told you about me, didn't she? He said, no, I read your face. She said, okay, well, read these other people's faces. And he started to panic, but then he realized he could pick one thing off everybody's face 
and know more about them than the most psychic person in the room. So that's what he did. He just went around, he picked something off everybody's face. Everybody was like, whoa, that was amazing. Um, then um, uh, the next time, the, the, then the next day, she was so impressed she called him up and invited him over to have some spaghetti dinner. So they really hit it off. They started corresponding back and forth. And then he to tells me, and three months ago, we got married. He said, it's the best relationship I've ever had in my life. He said, I taught her face reading too. So he says, now, you know, I can come home from work. My lids are hanging down. He goes, oh, honey, you had a tough day. He said, if I got really upset, my lips disappear. Oh, you don't have to tell me about it. You just go sit over the couch and, you know, <laughs> I'll get you something to drink. And he said, it even has become their own private language. So like when they go to the party, she'll go, oh, did you see those eyebrows? Ooh, I certainly did. You know, and they, <laughs> they both know what they're talking about. So they have their own private language. Yeah, so it's a, it says this is the best, best thing that he's ever run into. Um, so I'm gonna teach you how to do this. A dimple in the chin is a good sport. A cleft in the chin is adaptability. You can adapt to anything. Uh, you could throw this person out in the middle of the jungle and by the time the rescue party got there, they'd already have camp set up. Uh, if it's a dimple in the tip of the nose, routine sucks the life out of them. And see, with every single person you meet, knowing something about them is like being able to get on their wavelength. Ah, oh, I hate routine. <gasps> Me too. You know, I hate routine. See, you can, you can immediately have a connector with every person you meet. Um, dimples. Dimples are softening features. So even if the person has angled eyebrows and a pointed goatee beard, if they've got dimples, it's a softening feature and it's a connector. People open up and respond to that. Mental development lines, and I was telling you about that on Rich. These lines that run across the forehead, if you've got three or more lines that run across the forehead, uh, probably the equivalent of a master's degree. Now, I've got a lot of lines up there, but mine are broken if you see. So what that's about is wide range of interest, interested in a lot of different things. A single line is somebody with a single focused interest. A lot of times you see that on um, like a musician that from the time they were you know, just a kid, all they ever wanted to do was just do music, 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 and they get a single line. But it could be rocket science, you know, anything that you've got a passion about that you've com completely devoted your life to. I've got these too, these diagonal lines are mental pressure lines. I probably got those when I was practicing law. Uh, where, you know, I had a case the next morning, I wasn't ready for it, I wasn't gonna be able to get a continuance, so I was gonna be up all night studying for it. So that, you know, that's how you get those mental pressure lines. Single line, intense, I call that a freight train line. I'll give you an example about that. I uh, was teaching this to some paralegals a while back. Uh, about three weeks after the class, one of them calls up and says, oh, Mac, this stuff is amazing. She said, I gotta tell you what happened. He said, we were in the office the other day, and this guy came in. He just was talking to the loud top of his voice. He was like, I want to see an attorney. I'm not leaving here until I see an attorney. I have just come from the courthouse, and I gave you my money three weeks ago, and there's, there's no, nothing been filed in my case. I'm not leaving here until I see an attorney. Of course, she's the paralegal, so she's the sacrificial lamb. So the attorneys sent her out there to t take care of this guy. Um, she got out there. He was ranting and raving, and she said normally she would have gone, now, sir, we're taking care of it. She, we, you know, we, we're, we're handling everything. Everything's under control. But she took one look at this guy, and it looked like somebody had buried a hatchet between his eyebrows. So, you know, this is a freight train. You know, when you see a freight train's coming, step aside. You know, a lot of men didn't, a lot of men died. Don't hang out on the track when the train's coming. So she just sat down, and she just let him keep going. Every attorney I've ever dealt with, they always tell you one thing, turn around and tell you, don't do what they say they're gonna, just let him keep going and going and going. And when he completely ran out of steam, then she said, now how can I help you? And then he was ready to talk to her. But that's what to know, to know that you're dealing with a person that until they get from point A to point B, they're on a railroad track like a freight train and don't stand and try to block them. Let them, let them pass on by. Um, if you've got two lines, you're just too hard on yourself. But what's interesting, your face is like a history of your life. So you can look at somebody and immediately tell where they've been the hardest on themselves. If the line is deepest on the right side, like this person's is, the place where they've been the hardest on themselves is their professional or business side. If it's deepest on the left side, the place where they push themselves the hardest is their personal life. This is somebody that I don't care if they were sick, tired, hungry, or dying. If somebody comes to them that they're connected with and says, can you help me? It's like, oh yeah, sure. They'll get themselves up, make themselves go do it. Three lines are perfectionist. If you were raised in a type of environment where there was like a right way to do things and everything else was the wrong way, like religious or militaristic, you may get three lines. Now I wanna tell you though, <clears throat> your challenge with reading a perfectionist 
is a true perfectionist, a true perfectionist will never admit to being a perfectionist. A true perfectionist thinks you're only a perfectionist if you've never made a mistake. And yeah, I made a mistake back in 86, so I'm not a perfectionist, you know, so. <laughs> So yeah, it's what you, you have a challenge with true perfections, but it will tell you where they're coming from. Like it perfect, like it right. Two lines come together. Use both sides of your brain at the same time. I've got that. So no matter how good it looks on paper, it's got to feel right and vice versa. Lines in the bridge of your nose. Now, part of what makes your face look the way it does is genetic. Part of it is life experience, but part of it is what I would almost call karmic. And what I mean by that, these life lessons that have been passed on from generation to generation, like if you got the life lesson like that said something like, uh, now, now, son, I don't care if you had a hot date. You told the Smiths you were gonna mow their yard and if you don't mow that yard, you're not going anywhere. So, you know, you're taught that to have a word. If you raised with that and you took that in and you adopted that, you get these fine lines like Larry had, you know? So this is like, if they tell you they're gonna do it, now they have to do it. It's like somebody else signing a contract. Overly responsible. If you push past that point though, if you hang in there too long, what you get is one of these deep lines. I've got one of those. That's a burnout line. That's nature telling you, go find something that you love doing. Because if you don't attend to it, you're gonna wake up one day when you're 70 and go, I never got to do anything. All I ever did was work, and now I'm too old. Now I can't go skydiving and cry about you, Pichu. So if you, if you see this line right here, it's nature telling you, go find something that you really love doing. Um, big picture lines. Now, I've heard this called crow's feet. Uh, most of us get these. You know, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not true. And when they're offering you a free lunch, you know, there's no free lunch, so. <clears throat> this is important, courage lines. I was teaching a class at TCU a while back, too big a class to read everybody's face. So I said, uh, okay, uh, let's be fair here. Um, let me have a skeptic. So this guy comes up. He looks like Mr. West Texas. He's got his boots on arms folded, no lips, flat bottom lids. I took one look at him and said, uh, Ace, his name was Ace. I said, Ace, you know, you don't look like my typical face reading student. I said, uh, what brings you to the face reading class? He said, uh, well, he said, my wife took your class about three weeks ago. He said, I woke up the other night and she had that book over the top of me and I just want to know what she was seeing. So this is face reading for, <laughs> face reading for self-defense. But what, what Ace thought that face reading was, was like what psychics do. You know, you throw something out, you see how they respond to it, and then you respond to the response. Like, uh, oh, I see you're gonna go on a trip across big water, or maybe not. You know, like you kind of adjust to what they're doing. So Ace was gonna be Mr. Stoneface. No, no information back at all. Don't need that, I could read his face from a picture. So I started to read his face, read some things on his face, and I got to these lines here. I said, Ace, whoa, that's impressive. I said, uh, I said, I would normally call those courage lines. I would say that your character's been forged by overcoming adversity, that you know, you're like a piece of fine steel tempered in a hot fire. But I said, these lines are so deep on you, I'd say those have been to hell lines. And you got them on both sides. You got them on both your personal side and professional or business side. Now, Ace was still not gonna tell me squat. But the people in the class said, look, the lines, they're changing. And they were, you could see these lines getting deeper and growing down Ace's face. I finished reading his face and I said, uh, okay, what'd I miss? He said, dad, Bernie, he said, I hate to admit it. He said, but you nailed me. He said, especially about those courage lines. He said, me and my family, we owned a convenience store. And he said, we did pretty good at it. But he said, it burnt down. And he said, I didn't have any insurance. And he said, uh, I was uh, too proud to declare bankruptcy. So he said, I had to work two jobs for nine years to pay all that debt off. And now when he's telling us that, his cheeks are act actually vibrating. Now this is something I wanna explain to you. We're, we're going through what I think is a societal crisis right now. Uh, it's been growing for a long time. We started out as social animals. You know, like um, I would say uh, bees or ants. And we've been successful as a species because of working together. And for millions of years, we lived in these big groups. We, everybody lived in a tribe, you know, you had a tribe. In my grandparents' time, it had shrunken down to an extended family. You know, grandpa, grandma, mom and dad, and the kids, and they all worked on the farm. 
In my parents' time, it shrank to a nuclear family, mom and dad and the kids. Now, more people live alone than any other way. More people come home from work after working at their computer all day or their, you know, their, whatever they're doing. They come in, they lock the door behind them, and then they turn on the TV. Now, I want to tell you, that's really serious because while that TV can make you smile or make you laugh, it's not another human being. It can't give you life force. It can't, it can't ask you how your day was and get a response. It's a machine. And really, the worst thing we can possibly do to one another is put them in solitary confinement. I mean, that's what we do to our most vicious criminals is put them in solitary. That's the worst punishment we can have. And yet people are in solitary confinement. Here's the problem with that. When you go through life cut off and disconnected from other human beings, your life energy and life force gets messed up, gets skewed. Most people that you will run into are going through life with a feeling of quiet desperation. They wish that somebody could see them, know them, understand them, accept them, maybe even love them. But they don't get that because, you know, they've been blocked off. They've been walled off. People are desperate to be seen and heard and validated. Face reading is a tool that allows you to do that easily, kind of like a game. But it allows you to give, to give back that sense of life connection. And when you can connect with somebody, I don't care for how brief a moment, when you have one of these present moment unguarded authentic interactions, in that brief moment, there's an exchange or flow of life force that changes everything. I'll give you a perfect example. I was in uh, Las Vegas uh, a few months ago talking to the International ISSA. Now that sounds impressive until I tell you ISSA stands for International Sanitary Supply Association. So these were the janitors of the world. But like they were the janitors of the world. I mean, these were the people that, that clean, you know, Humana and Microsoft and IBM. I mean, all over the whole world. That convention was packed. I mean, there wasn't a single square inch of that convention floor that didn't have an exhibitor on it. And there was like, there must have been 15,000 of these attendees. I was sort of a last minute addition to their program. So I got there and I was trying to check out to see, well, you know, what, how did they introduce me? Where is I going to be? And I found their little program, kind of like that one, the little one you had, and it said, uh, Amazing Face Reading by Mac Fulfer, How to Judge a Book by Its Cover. That's it. That, that's, that's the only introduction I had, period. No other promotion whatsoever. And then I checked the time. They had me down at 8 o'clock the next morning on the other side, completely away from the showroom floor of the convention center. I'm thinking, you know... Las Vegas, after they've been up all night gambling and drinking at 8 o'clock in the morning, there won't, be, there won't be five people show up for this. So I had some time. I had that full day ahead of time. So I found a place where there were these aisles where all these people were running by. And I pulled my table up to one of these aisles, and I got my sign. And, and everybody that went by would go, hi, how are you? How are you doing? Hi, how are you? And just, you know, everybody, I greeted everybody that went by. Most of them were just in their titanium shells. You know, they were so busy doing what they... But every now and then, one would look up and he'd see the sign and he'd go, mm, nah, uh, 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 uh. oh, come on, you don't have to do anything. Just come over here, stand here for just a minute. So they'd come over and they'd stand there. Now this is a, this is a physical example of a wall. When somebody's doing this for you, they've got, a, they've got another wall up. They've got their, their invisible wall and then they've got the other wall up. Then they had their chin up. Now when somebody's got their chin up, they're protecting their inner being with preparedness for conflict. So their chin was up. I'd start to read their face. And you go, that's amazing. My wife told me that just last week. Whoa, that is incredible. <laughs> what was incredible was the next morning at 8 o'clock in Las Vegas on the opposite side of the convention center, it was standing room only for my presentation. Not because anything had changed except that I had connected with these people. And when you connect... You change your relationship. And then they wanted to bring their friends. You know, oh, we got to go see this guy. And it wasn't anything about the face reading. It's because they wanted to see who was this person that they connected with. What was even more interesting, by the end of the day, everybody was just sort of like drug out. You know, they could, I mean, it was, they'd been going for, at a frenzy for the whole day. And I, I felt like I just woke up. I mean, I felt perfect. 
Because every time you have one of these interactions with somebody, there's this life force exchange. And in that brief moment, there's no giver and there's no receiver. There's just a moment of shared being. And there's a healing that takes place. There's a, there's a life energy healing that takes place. So one of the things you're doing is, you know, you're helping yourself every time that you connect with somebody on this level. Um, little lines by the side of the nose, somebody's playing with you. When those lines pop out, they're having a playful, mischievous sense of humor. They're teasing with you or playing with you. Lines from the nose to the corners of the mouth, disappointment lines. But you can look at somebody and see where they've had the greater disappointment. If the line's deepest on the left, it's been in their personal life. If it's deepest on the right, it's in their professional or business side. When the lines cross the corners of the mouth and come down the chin, it's not just disappointment. It's grief, loss, pain, gut-wrenching pain. If it's on the left side, if it's on the right side, it's about professional grief, loss, and pain, like loss of a business, loss of career, bankruptcy. If it's on the left side, it's like uh, loss of a loved one, loss of a child. Um, something of that magnitude. In fact, I was talking to uh, a group over in Dallas. It was the hoitiest, hoitiest bunch of women group you ever saw in your life. Uh, what was their name? Uh, Vital Minds. I was talking to Vital Minds, and uh, I, uh, I was telling them kind of what I was telling you, but we took a break for lunch, and a couple of these ladies came up, and one of them said, um, uh, well, I really enjoyed your presentation, she said, but it didn't apply to me. I said, oh, fantastic, great. Uh, you know, that's how I learned to read faces. I, I, it's more important to me to know what didn't work than what did work because it, it lets you see what the nuances are. You know, if a, if a straight eyebrow means this and a crooked eyebrow means that, well, one in the middle, oh, yeah, please. What didn't work? Please tell me. She said, well, um, now, I, I thought if I heard you correctly, you said that if somebody had lost a child, they should have a line from the left corner of their mouth to their chin. I said, well, yeah, if it affected them. Now, you know, if it didn't bother you very much, well, it might not, but... But yeah, she said, well, I have to be fair with you. She said, um, it was 26 years ago. And she said, um, I have had two facelifts. She said, but um, I lost a child and I don't have that line. I didn't get to say a word to her. Her friend standing next to her said, Mary Lou, you do too. And she dove in her purse and she whipped out her compact. She opened up the mirror. She said, ah, that wasn't there a minute ago. And I'm sure that it wasn't because this was a lady who studied her face. But when she brought up that old, buried, historical, suppressed thought and feeling, that mark popped back out through all the spackling and facelifts that she could put on her face. So, so it, 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 your face is dynamic. Your face is changing moment to moment. Your face is being held in place from moment to moment by your thoughts and feelings. Um, line up upper lip, I'll help you guys out. If you're in a relationship with some woman's got this line, I, I, first I gotta tell you, I, I, I bet, I don't know how many tens of thousands of faces I have read, I don't think I've seen four, maybe five guys that, with a line on their upper lip. Part of that's due because of how the difference between the way little boys and little girls are raised, especially in this culture. You know, little boys are taught, be aggressive, go for it, make your mark in the world, you know, climb the mountain, make the touchdown. Little girls are sometimes taught, it's not okay to be angry or sad. Straighten up that face, young lady. What if your face froze like that? Now, you can just get to your room. Do you get that face straightened up or I'll give you something to cry about? So you go in your room and you practice putting a smile on your face. Now, if you practice putting a smile on your face long enough, you get one of these little four smile lines in your upper lip. Here's what I wanna help you guys out with. If you're in a relationship with some woman who's got this line in her upper lip, she probably didn't get the amount of nurturing, protection, help, care, or support she deserved growing up because it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease, not the one that's smiling. Like, Faye doesn't need anything, she's smiling. So they didn't get it. Your mantra should be, honey, are you okay? Are you feeling all right? Is there anything I can help you with? Now I wanna tell you, you may run into a double whammy. And here's what I mean. If she's got this little line on her upper lip, and because she didn't get the support and feedback, she just learned to do everything for herself, just to be totally self-reliant and self-sufficient. She will also have a thin nose. So if you've got a thin nose and a line on her upper lip, here's the warning. I don't care if you've waited the whole year to watch the Super Bowl and the big game has finally come on and she goes off to the grocery store to do all the shopping. 
When she gets back, this is what's going to happen. She's going to get out of her car. She's going to look around and see who's going to help her get all this stuff out of the car. She's not going to ask you because thin noses don't ask. The first time you're going to know there's something wrong is when you hear those groceries getting set down on the counter really hard. You're going to go, what's the matter? Nothing, I'm fine. Oh, that's not the kind of fine you want to hear. That's not, that's not a good fine. There's no defense. You can't say, but you didn't ask me. Because you know what she's going to say then? If you really love me, I wouldn't have to ask you. So there's no, there's no defense there either. So I, here's what I'm warning you. I don't care if they're about to score the winning touchdown. If you hear the gravel crunching in the driveway where she's just got back from the store, you need to get your butt up and get out there and help her out if you want the rest of your day to go all right. So, you know, just, just take, it, take it for what I'm telling you. Um, lines here. Power, these are power dimples. The way these people are powerful is by encouraging other people and lifting them up. Like, oh, thank you. That's wonderful. I couldn't have done that without you. But somebody who's an exhorter encourages other people by lifting them up. I got in trouble with this one. Mm. Um, I don't know if y'all know how Texas is set up. In Texas, you sort of go back in time as you go west. You know, Dallas and Houston are both on New York time. Only an hour behind, so they're going twice as fast. In fact, in Dallas and Houston, if you ever get on one of those loops that runs around, don't put your blinker on. Because if they see you with your blinker on, they're going to zoom up and cut you off. You know, you're not going to get in there. Um, I live over in Fort Worth. Now, we're further west, and, you know, we're a lot more laid back. We settle a lot of our cases on the elevator. Like, hey, Bob, come on, give me those depositions. Oh, Mag, just make me an offer. Let's get this thing over with. Well, I'm teaching a class out at Weatherford. Now, Weatherford's a further west than Fort Worth, about 18 years back in time. And uh, I'm going around, and I'm using people's faces as part of my face reading tool. I get to this uh, Weatherford gal. I guess she's pushing 70. She's got her billfold in her back pocket, got her blue jeans on, salt of the earth Weatherford gal, taking the face reading class. I come to her, I take one look at her upper lip and I just blurt out what I see. I said, wow, now your libido's cranked up. And they went, whoa, Mac, this is Weatherford. <laughs> you know, so I, so um, luckily I was wearing my diplomatic ears and I said, uh, uh, but I'm not talking so much about sex. Uh, no, what I meant to say was um, affection. Yeah, affection is a form of communication for you. You need to have physical contact, touch, and affection. You need to be held and loved and kissed and cuddled and stroked. And I'm looking at this 70-year-old lady, blue jeans on, billful in the back pocket. And I'm going, Mac, you have no idea of what her personal life's like. And you're telling her if she doesn't have this romantic, touchy-feely relationship, her life's going to be over. So I uh, had to, the ears had to kick in again, so I had to think on my feet. And I said, that, uh, but I tell you what, you know, if you don't have that kind of relationship, if you don't have a relationship where you have all that physical contact, touch, and affection, I said, then uh, uh, you ought to get you a cat. Yeah, I'll get you a cat. Something you can love and stroke and touch and cuddle. And she started dying laughing. She was laughing so hard she couldn't talk for a minute. And then she held up six fingers. And I said, I got you, didn't I? You got six cats. She said, uh, nope. I've had six husbands. <laughs> <laughs> She said, I just got three cats. So I guess it's like, uh, you know, you're not working out, Buster. We're going to move you along here. Get, go try something out. Um, most beautiful thing I can see on a person's face, those lines in your upper lip. Those are not smoker's lines, B vitamin lines, menopause lines. Those are survivor lines. And you earn those. If you went through something that almost kills you, but not quite, you get these lines. If it's on your personal side, if it's about your health, your spouse's health, your family, things on your personal side, it'll come on the left side. If it's about business failures, setbacks, crisis, you get them on this side. Um, I, I gotta tell you, um, a perfect example, I was talking to the InfoMart over in uh, Dallas. I asked for a volunteer. Lady comes up and uh, I started to read her face. And I was reading different things on her face. And I said, uh, whoa, I said, no, you really have a, a beautiful face to me, but I'll tell you why. I said, first of all, you've got depth. And the things I see is you've got these courage lines, which tell me, you know, you've faced things that scared the daylights out of you, but you did it anyway. Lines are deepest on the left side. So the place where it, that's really been the most impactful, where you've had to really rise to the challenge has been your personal side. I said, you've got these disappointment lines. Once again, the disappointment's been more in your personal life. 
And you've got these, you've got these uh, compassion lines where you've dealt, dealt with grief, loss, pain. Pain's been mostly in the personal side, I said, but you've got these survivor lines. And the survivor lines are over here. It tells me, you know, there's been times when you've wondered like how you were gonna make it, what you were gonna do. And she teared up. Now I gotta tell you, most of the time when you read somebody's face, they break into laughter. Every now and then, when you read somebody's face, they'll tear up. Now the first time that happened to me, it was like, oh yeah, I don't wanna make anybody unhappy. I don't wanna hurt their feelings. I don't wanna make them sad. But the thing was, the people who would tear up would be the ones that would buy two and three books. It's like, what is going on? I finally figured it out. These people had gotten so trapped behind their invisible social wall that they felt invisible. They felt like nobody sees me, nobody cares, nobody knows, nobody understands me. And to feel seen and heard and validated is so overwhelming that these were tears of relief. They're like the tears of a lost child that's suddenly been found. Like, oh, somebody gets me. She says, I've never told anybody this. She said, but my husband's an alcoholic. And for the past two years, he hasn't worked a lick. He said, she said, you know, the whole support of the family has been on my shoulders. And there's been times when I didn't know if we were even gonna have food on the table. Now that's not the important part of this story. After, after the presentation, two of her coworkers came up and they said, oh, we really enjoyed your presentation, but we feel terrible. You know that lady whose face you read? I said, yeah. She said, well, we work with her. We're, we're, uh, some, we, she's in our department. And she said, uh, behind her back, you know, we call her the B word, but we didn't know what she was going through. My God, if we, know, if we had known what she was going through, we wouldn't have criticized her. We'd have tried to help her. So that's what I'm trying to tell you. If you can really understand somebody, it's almost impossible to hate them. If you can be able to stand in the other person's shoes and see where they've come from and what they've dealt with and what, what's up for them, then there's a huge awareness or a compassion that comes out of that. Um, Gift of Gab line. Now I was reading this lady's face the other day. I read a Gift of Gab line. She said, no, 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 no. That's the first thing you miss, Mac. That's the only thing you miss. She said, I hate to talk. I said, okay, it's just face reading. You know, it's not rocket science. The wonderful thing about face reading is when you're trying to read somebody's face, People are so appreciative that you're trying to know them. And not only that, you know, if you're reading somebody's face and you miss them, what happens next? Ah, oh, no, 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 I'm not like that. I'm like this. And you just succeeded in what I'm talking about. They had to drop that wall and they had to connect with you. You just found out more information about them than if you'd have known them for six months. So I said, oh, okay, well, that's great. I said, what do you do for a living? She said, uh, I'm a school teacher. Well, duh, you know, if you stand up and talk for eight hours a day, you're gonna get a gift of gab line, you know? It's not how much you like to talk, it's how much you do talk. This line on your chin, uh, overachiever. Now I wanna tell you, for you ladies in relationship, line on your chin, you need to be there for them. They need somebody who can pick them up when they're down. You know, if they've got that, they're unstoppable. They're already overachievers. Uh, for you guys, don't forget, honey, you look good. These are the buckets with a hole in it. Somebody that fills their bucket back up. And uh, perfect. Uh, this is important. Heart lines. If you put so much, here's where this often comes from. If uh, I've seen this numerous times, where like uh, somebody was raised in a family where they got feedback like, oh, your dad was such a great man. You'll never be able to fill his shoes. Or, or, oh, your uncle was a state senator. Or your brother was a captain of the football team. Some place where you got compared. Then what you did to prove your value or worth is like, well, I'm gonna, I'll prove my worth by setting goals and then accomplishing the goal. You know, you set a goal and you try to accomplish the goal. And you go, well, what's wrong with that? Well, the problem is when you start competing with yourself, then every time you succeed in the goal, you just bump the bar up. And that's okay for a while, but when that line comes in your ear, you're putting out too much. You're driving yourself. You're, you're giving away more of your life energy than you're replen replenishing. So it's really kind of like going through life with a box of rocks on your back going, I bet I can carry one more. I can bet I can carry, but when you can't carry that last rock, they call that heart attack. Now I wanna tell you, if you have these lines in your ears, a slight mental adjustment would be helpful declare victory. That whatever the heck you were trying to prove, you've already proven it. 
And the people that you're really trying to prove it to are probably already dead. So delegate. Now, it won't get done as good as you do it and it won't get done as fast as you do it, but you'll still be here. Don't make yourself the quarterback that has to get the ball across the goal line by yourself. So those are early warning signs. Um, secret lines, things that are held in that people will not talk about. Left side, personal. Right side, professional and business. But um, I often see this on, on kids that suffer child abuse. You know, something can happen and, uh, you know, it might take 20 minutes, but then it was so serious or so severe, it's like, ugh, just push it down and not deal with it. So uh, that's where you get those secret lines. Um, obstinate chin. Uh, when we steal ourselves to keep from being bowled over. Uh, Clinton, for example, after the Monica Lewinsky story, you never again saw him on TV where you didn't see when he got on that you could see this tension in his chin. You know, it's like prepared preparedness for conflict. These are often people who are competitors too. Um, I want to give you all something else just in the bit of time we got, something that you can actually use. You cannot not communicate. You're communicating every single second whether you realize it or not. Here's some other things that you can pick up immediately. First of all, uh, your thumb. Your thumb is like a metaphor for your head. In fact, if you watch a little baby when a little baby's got the colic or needs their diaper changed or is hungry or, is, you know, when they're crying, they're crying and holding their thumbs. It's like they were holding their head. They're feeling threatened. Holding the left thumb, threatened personally. Holding the right thumb, feeling threatened by what's going on out here in the external environment. Holding both thumbs, feeling extremely threatened. What a powerful piece of information. So you're trying to sell something to somebody and you know, you see it one part in the presentation, they're feeling threatened. I, you know, I was watching TV the other night and I saw, Char, I saw uh, uh, Dave Letterman when he was interviewing Nancy Pelosi and he was holding his thumb. That, that was not a good interview for him. He was feeling threatened by it, feeling threatened by what was going on there. Um, so what you can do though, is you can connect with the person. You know, the first time I looked at this stuff, I gotta tell you, I found it pretty threatening. Oh, you too? Because, you know, people don't wanna say I'm stupid, you know, or, I mean, until you're, you're able to connect with them. Um, everything you do counts. Uh, I'm stiff up. That's somebody who's holding on to their position. They're not gonna yield their position. So uh, you're, if you're talking to somebody who's telling you that they're negotiating, that they're willing to compromise, but their thumb is stiffen up, as long as that thumb is stiffened up, they're just like concrete. They may be all mixed up, but they're permanently set. And you might as well go off and talk about something else. Because as long as that thumb, or I guess you could politely reach over and put their thumb down for them. But as, as long as that thumb is stiffened up, they're hanging on to their position for dear life. And you see that with a lot of politicians. Like, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. You know, that's what that stiff thumb's about. Everything counts. So, um, uh, talking to somebody and their hands disappear. Now your hands could go in your pockets because they were cold or because you, you know, wanted to count your change or, but here's what I'm telling you, put it into the context of the situation. Like, uh, hey, Bob, was that you I saw down at the restaurant with that good looking woman the other night? Uh, yeah, that's my secretary. Uh -huh. Whoa, why did that hand disappear at just that moment in time? And it's on the personal side. You know, or if I'm trying to buy a used car, um, is that the correct odometer reading? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Oh, mm -mm. Something just happened there, you know, or worse than that. I don't know, you know, <laughs> so not, something not being revealed. So just to put this into a context, to bring up to your conscious awareness what's going on. Every single thing counts. You know, little kids know this pretty, uh, they're a lot more in touch with this than we are as adults. We, we sort of start living from the head up. But a little kid, when he gets stumped on a test, he starts doing this. That's good because this is the area of self-will. So he's trying to will himself to remember the answer. You know, like, what was the answer? So it's willing yourself to remember the answer. Um, all of us do this. And we all have good reasons for why we do this. You know, uh, I'm cold. Uh, me, I grew this little shelf. It's be a shame to waste it, you know. <laughs> uh, but this is a defense mechanism. And when you see somebody with a defense mechanism, they've got up a wall, what do you do? Well, it's counterintuitive, but the thing to do is do what they do because we're all connected with each other. 
For example, how do you get that baby to open its mouth when you're trying to feed it green beans? You know, the, those nasty green beans out of the baby food jar. Ah, you do what you want them to do. So that's always true. Anything that's ever true is always true. So somebody's doing this to you, do that too. But then see how many other ways can you connect? Maybe as they're talking to you, maybe they're, maybe they're rocking back and forth. I do that too. Watch how they're breathing. Watch what, what, as many things as you possibly can to imitate what they're doing. And what happens is at some point, subconsciously, you reach critical mass. And what I mean by critical mass is you're in this dance with them that they're not even aware of, and then you can lead the dance. And when you put your arms down, it's like, then they don't feel comfortable with their arms up anymore. You know, so you just, you just change the dynamic and you're, you're leading in the dance instead of following. Um, what we store on the top of our head? Confusion. Now it could be itchy scalp, for me it could be sunburn, you know. But uh, now if you're talking to somebody and they scratch the top of their head, bring up to your own conscious awareness that what they could be saying is, I'm kind of confused about that. And just to say, you know, I, this stuff's kind of confusing. You want to go over it again? Oh yeah, could we? Yeah. Um, what we store in our forehead, doubt and worry. So, you know, you're trying to tell somebody something. We always think that the problem is the price, but it might not be the price at all. You know, you're talking to somebody and you suddenly, and you start talking about their delivery and then it's like, oh, you know, you look to me like you're having some doubts and worries about the delivery. Wow, I was, but how did you know? Because, you know, they're telling you. The, what comes out of a person's mouth is the least reliable information you get from somebody. What they do that they don't know that they're doing and that they couldn't control if they did is about where they're really coming from. It's what's on the other side of the wall. What we store in our eyes is fear of uh, being controlled by others. It's also kind of anger. Um, so, uh, this, is, this is anger about feeling like you've been put upon by somebody. For example, if I said, uh, Oh, listen, could you just finish up these reports for me? I, 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 I need to get down the line, way here. And uh, she goes, oh yeah, sure, I could do that. Her mouth said yes. She really says, uh-uh, Buster, that's your job. I don't want to do that. What we store in our nose is fear of being controlled by, each, by somebody. Um, in fact, if I say, hey, Larry, could you help me move this piano? He goes, yeah, sure, I'll help you move the piano. He really said, nah, I, don't. I mean, his mouth said yes, but he really said, no, I don't want to. Um, we often touch our nose when we just negated what went on before it. Even people that you see on TV. I mean, this is a wonderful way to really figure out what's going on because it's almost a reflex reaction. You know, people just touch their nose. It's like they just negated, like, like uh, and, I, and I think that uh, this, he's gonna win the election by a landslide. Nope, that's not what he really thinks, you know? So you can just see that immediately. Um, I gotta warn you though, your nose itches when you're lying or thinking about sex. <laughs> so if you're lying about sex, you, you really better watch where you put your hands, you know. Anybody knows that's gonna catch on. So that's, that's what shows up. Um, what we store behind our ears is fear of misunderstanding or fear of being misunderstood. So if you're talking to somebody and they rub behind their ears, tell them again, because they're saying, I don't think I got it, or I don't think you're getting me. You know, they're like, I don't believe I'm understanding what you just said, you know. Um, what we store, now I use this one all the time in jury selection. I've seen it going on out here. When you see this, or this, or this. The person really wants to put their hand over whoever's mouth is moving. <laughs> they're withholding acceptance. It doesn't mean that they're lying, they say you're lying, but they're withholding acceptance. So if I look up in that jury box, and I see three or more of those jury people doing this, that witness is killing us because the jury will always punish the side that they think's lying, you know? And what they're saying is, I'm, I'm doubtful, I'm withholding acceptance about that. Um, what you store on your chin is fear of inferiority. Uh, in fact, you know, you could take the CEO and the president of the company and have everybody, all the employees come through and have a one-on-one -on -one with them. A bunch of them will do this. Why do you do that? because it feels good. It makes you feel like you've got a bigger chin. You're up against this overwhelming authority, you know, so you, got, you want a bigger chin, you know. Um, so you, you see this, you're overwhelming the person. You know, they're feeling like they're, you're kind of overdoing it. This is a little different, like what you're doing, like this or like this. What this is about, this is trying to get some energy out of your chin back up into your brain. 
This is saturation point. It's like, oh, I've had enough of this stuff. I mean, I'm ready for something else. You know? So when I see three or more people doing this, I know I need to shut up and stop. Um, everything, every single thing counts. Uh, uh, what's your cheeks? What's your cheeks? Uh, cheeks that pop out into the light or people that like to be into the light, like attention. I call them movie star cheeks. Uh, when they are sunk in, they are, are avoiding the light. And I guess a perfect example of that, because you don't realize how much, how plastic your face is. Uh, Clinton, for example, when he came back on TV and had to say, well, maybe it wasn't exactly like I told you the first time, you know, his cheeks, cheeks were really sunk in. Or O.J. Simpson, you know, after he'd been riding around in the, in the van with his buddy Al Cowling, when he got out, his normal movie star cheeks were really sunk in. In fact, your cheeks sink in, actually sink in, when you've experienced some kind of shock to your system. I've seen people who, they may have had cancer for months, but they, nothing happened until they got the diagnosis. And when they got the diagnosis, the shock to their system is what causes those cheeks to really get hollow or sink in. Um, what we store behind our, our head, repressed thoughts, things we don't wanna think about. You know, we talk about people being a pain in the neck. How many of you have ever had neck and shoulder pain? Yeah, guess what that is? Responsibility. We hold responsibility on our shoulders. Now here's the problem. In our world, it's buzzing so fast, you know, where you're in your car and you're thinking about where you're going and what you need to do and you're not present. In our world, we get to the point where we just live in our head and we run in our whole life out of our head. But we are physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual beings. So a lot of times your body knows more than your head knows. And what happens is your body, when you've got it tuned out, tries to communicate with you. It's sort of like, you know, a mother, if she saw her kid going towards the street, she'd go, Johnny, 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 you know, to get his attention, your body's doing the same thing. So if you're taking on too much responsibility and you just keep going, then your body cranks up the pain, you know, like, oh, you know, to get your attention. Um, how many of you have ever had a low back pain? Yeah, now if you had low back pain and it wasn't caused from picking up something heavy, stress runs right to the small of your back. So look out into your external world and see where am I taking on too much stress? Even if you don't change what you're doing, the fact that you can bring it up to conscious awareness and that your body knows that your mind knows about it will help alleviate some of the pain. You know, for the low back pain, your doctor always says things like, uh, okay, here, sleep on your side, put a pillow between your knees and uh, do these exercises. Well, that's good for the symptoms, but the cause of low back pain is stress. What we store in our butt is fear of failure. What we store in our thighs is fear of lack of capacity, like, oh God, I can't do all this, this is too much. What we store behind our knees, fear of death. Um, now that happened for me not too long ago. I was told that I was about being on the big circle that runs around, uh, 635 runs around Dallas. I'm needing to get off. It's several lanes of traffic. Nobody's letting me up. I've had my blinker on forever. Everybody, you know, everybody just zooms up and just cuts me off. So I see a big truck up ahead and I think, you know, God, there's usually a, a gap in front of those trucks. If I could get up there, then I could get over. I finally get up there, I go into the gap and some idiot going 90 miles an hour on the other side of the truck that I can't see has the idea to do the same. We both go into the hole at the same time. You can see the whites around both of our eyes at the same time. We both got out, nothing happened. No wreck, nothing happened. Until I finally got off the freeway and got my car stopped and my legs were shaking so hard I couldn't stand up. You know, that uh, fear of death is what you hold behind your knees. What you hold in your calves is fear of lack of capability. Like, oh, that's computers, I'm no good with that stuff. What we hold in our feet, fear of being ourself. If you really wanna connect with somebody, you know to rub their feet, you know? If they won't let you touch your feet, like, no, I'm ticklish, that's body armor. That's like. And you know, guys are like, I like you fine, buddy, but I'm not touching those feet. You know, it's like, a, so it's a, you know, that's what, it's, it's fear of being yourself. We've done that for a long time. Um, think about uh, the Bible. Did you ever read in there where Jesus was washing feet with oil? That sounded like not just a foot wash, but a foot wash and a rub, you know? So, I mean, it's connecting, you know, that rubbing feet is connecting. Um, here's how to use this. So you find yourself walking down the hall, holding both thumbs. Wow, what's making me feel threatened? I don't know. Simple thing you can do. Go over, uh, find a place where you won't be disturbed. Uh, make sure the lights are dimmed a little bit. Uh, make sure it's quiet. And do a simple relaxation exercise. A simple relax, re relaxation exercise 
is to calm yourself completely, close your eyes, and count backwards from like 20 to zero. And with each number, imagine like you're going down a flight of stairs. And with each number, you're relaxing more and more, like uh, 19, 18, 17. And when you get to zero and you're completely relaxed, ask your body, not your mind, ask your body, what is it? And that's it, just what is it? And then listen with your body. So you notice, oh, I got a tingle in the top of my head. Ooh, I got a crick in my neck. Whoa, I got a pain in my butt. What? Okay, what is it that I'm confused about that I don't want to think about because I'm afraid I'm going to fail anyway? Oh, I know what that is, you know? So you can bring it up to conscious awareness. You can deal with it. Um, before I go any further, is there any questions anybody's had at this point? Okay, great. Um, I've got about... 15 minutes, I wanna go through it fast. Mustache. Mustache is somebody that's covering up their femininity, keeping up a tougher, gruffer, <laughs> tougher, gruffer exterior. They're like, I'm no wuss, you know. Beard, uh, same sort of thing, only, uh, you know, this is somebody that needs a little more authority, and so it's, it, the first face you read your own, so it gives you a way of being, you know, macho and tough. But the beard tells you something. The bottom tells you how the person's gonna act on it. Round beards are people like Santa Claus. When they get down to acting on things, they put people first. Square beard, square, square beard or square chin, somebody goes all out for their goals, causes, values, or ideas. Pointed beard, like the devil's got a pointed beard. You know, somebody that's uh, interested in focusing or accomplishing their goal, they don't care about other people. Uh, foreheads, round full forehead, create a problem solver. Can't stand being micromanaged though. So, you know, you can't, if you've got somebody with a round full forehead, you know, the best thing to do is give them a chore and let them figure it out. Hatchback. Hatchback, good back brain memory. Uh, show them once, they can probably do it. This guy could probably take his car apart when he was, you know, 15 and stretch all the pieces down the sidewalk and then put it back together and follow that system and procedure and it would work. Uh, this person would have a few pieces left over and think, well, there's some good things I could do with that, you know, so. <laughs> um, Straight forehead, mine like an engineer. They can take problems that other people say, we can't do that, go, well, wait a minute, what if we do it like this? And they break it into smaller pieces and solve it one step at a time. Uh, but they're sequential thinkers. They think in order. Brow ridge, um, a little bony ridge across the top of your forehead. I, uh, I, those are people who are rigid in following systems and procedures. I ran into that. I, I hadn't got a ticket, I guess, in 20 years. The other night I was going over to see a friend of mine. I saw these flashing lights and I said, well, okay, it pulled over. Policeman comes to the car, you know, he's standing up there. He said, uh, driver's license, insurance. Okay, I said, what did I do? Stop sign. I'm like, wow, man. Well, I, I must have been two stop signs. I, I, because one stop sign, I only remember one stop sign since the light, and I had to stop behind a Lincoln Continental for that one, so I bet there's two stop signs. He finished writing me the ticket. I circled the block, come back around. There's only one stop sign. He still parked right up there where he was, so I get out of my car and I'm gonna go talk to this guy, you know? I walk over and he sticks his head out of the car and this is the first time I can see his face clearly and he's got a brow ridge like you could set your coffee cup on and it wouldn't fall off. <laughs> and I said, eh, never mind, I'll just talk to the judge, you know, because he's already written the ticket, there's no way, it's not, you're not gonna talk him out of the ticket, there's not gonna be any change in that. Um, big self-will pad. Uh, somebody like has innate self-will ever since uh, childhood. Eyebrows, I told you about these. We'll go over them real quick. Curved eyebrows, people-oriented. You wanna sell something to somebody with curved eyebrows? Show them how it works for somebody else. Give them an example. Tell them how it worked for you. Straight eyebrows, they don't care about that. They want the facts, the data, the proof. They wanna hold it in their hand. Angled eyebrows, mentally in control. Ask them, what do you think? What do you want? What's your impression? Let them tell you first, which makes them feel like they're mentally in control, then they will drop that wall and open up to you. High eyebrows, selective. You can't stampede them or push them. They need time to make up their own mind. Low eyebrows, you can talk as fast as you want to. Two words out of your mouth, they can already finish the sentence for you. Um, here's the challenge though. These people with low eyebrows chew on a problem like a dog chewing on a bone, but once it's not a problem anymore, they erase it. They erase their hard drive. So you can see the problem between these two. I told you about how this one stores things on the emotional drive. If you're in relationship with somebody with high eyebrows and you have low eyebrows, be sure to carry a tape recorder around in your pocket because here's what's gonna happen. You know, uh, say for example, you said, um, 
Oh, honey, look, Sears has riding lawnmowers on sale this week, just 900 bucks. Her response to that would be, did you check out Lowe's? Did you look at, did you look at Home Depot? Uh, what about Ward's? Selective, they're not gonna, but you say, okay, come on, honey, we got you the couch, I'll take care of this. You, she says, okay. And you think, whoa, I won, I got my riding lawnmower. I wanna tell you though, I don't care if it's a year later or a year and a half later. You say, honey, could you take the lawnmower in? She's gonna say, me? Don't you remember when we got that lawnmower, you said you were gonna take care of it. And you're like, I don't remember that. Well, you better carry your tape recorder around with you. You're gonna argue with somebody with high eyebrows. Um, eyebrow types mean something, bushy, uh, lots of mental activity. Doesn't mean you're a genius, but it means you have lots of mental activity. Thin eyebrows, how do you get thin eyebrows? By plucking them out. Why do you pluck them out? To look better. These are people who are too sensitive to their perception of how they imagine other people see them. So the thing to do, if I'm running into somebody with thin eyebrows, start by leading, lead off as a compliment. You look good, That's, oh, I love that. You know, some, establish immediately you're not their critic, that you're not criticizing them. Winged eyebrows, visionaries. They need to be on the planning committee, but if you're selling something to them, show them the big idea, the potential, the possibility. That's the exciting part for them. They're interested, they're excited about what could be. Even eyebrows, they see all the related aspects quickly and easily. Uh, they have to develop a challenge for other people's inability. Uh, at managerial eyebrows. You know, I went to talk to Miss, Mrs. Baird's break room one time to their manager's meeting. All 10 of them had that type of eyebrow. And I don't, and that's a pretty rare eyebrow, but they'd all worked their way up through the ranks. So these are people that they're a little slow about taking something on, but once they do, they're good for completion and follow through. Now you can see how the, these two, this, the one with the uh, visionary eyebrows actually works best in a relationship with one who has the, the managerial eyebrows. So you have one person that has the big idea and the other person to finish it and follow through and complete on it. A unibrow, single brow, mine never shuts up. It's going on hyperactive all the time. There's no off switch, drives them crazy. So uh, tangled eyebrows, devil's advocates. They're always asking those yeah, but what if questions. So you're talking with somebody who's got tangled eyebrows, understand that. The interesting thing is we respond to tangled eyebrows by by attacking. So, uh, you know, the way that people respond to the tangled eyebrows is they have an instant uh, reaction or attack of them. Uh, if, um, if you're getting more static than you really want, you might want to smooth your eyebrows out. I, I, told, uh, I told Jim Wright that the other day. He was at a, a thing I was talking to. I said, you know, if you just got up and combed your eyebrows every morning, you'd still be Speaker of the House. So, <laughs> access hairs good conscious access to inner thoughts and feelings, you're tapping into that subconscious data bank. So on the left side, it's judge a character. Be around somebody a few minutes, got them figured out. Right side, it's gotta look at something and go, that ain't gonna work. Uh, scattered hairs, wide range of interest, interested in a lot of different things. Chameleon, no eyebrows or really light colored eyebrows. People can't figure you out. So what they do, they just project onto you who they are. You know, they think that, I mean, you could drop you off at a Baptist convention, they think you were a good Baptist or take you to the Catholic conference and you'd fit there too. They just, they just assume that you are what they are. Um, height of ears, high ears, takes in information very, very quickly. Low ears, wants things perfect, wants it right, wants it correct. Uh, now there's different combinations. So high ears and high eyebrows uh, challenge a sensory overload. So you're dealing with somebody that has high ears and high eyebrows, don't rush them. You know, give them time. Uh, let them think about it. Let them call you back the next day. Uh, high ears and low eyebrows, or low ears and high eyebrows, high ears and low eyebrows, uh, kind of what I got. That's one that your mind moves a mile a minute, you know, talks a mile a minute, never shuts up. You know, that, those people, you can blast them with all the information you want. Low ears with high eyebrows are strategists. They take in information carefully. They need time to put it in their mental framework and come up with a plan. Low ears with low eyebrows push themselves too hard. They want things perfect, but they want it yesterday. So that's, that's kind of a strain. Um, looks like we just about ran out of time. I have enjoyed talking with y'all so much. I wanna tell you something though. Every single one of you in here can read faces just as good as I can. It's not a psychic gift. It's not some special talent. It's just like learning how to read. And if you start, like I said, with your own face, then what happens is you've already will change the way you see people. You don't know it yet, but you already cannot look at people the same way again. Already when you go out into the world and you're seeing whites in their people's eyes or you're seeing their bottom lids go flat on you, you already know that there's something going on there. 
um, you just didn't realize how much information this is. And it tells, it tells you what is really going on with the person. It tells you what's really happening. So it, it allows you to connect. Thank you so much. I've appreciated your morning. And uh, I hope anybody who wants to get their uh, face read or get a book, I'll be up here afterward. Thank you. Sweet love, Paul.